Hi, I'm Ryder Hask, and this is the People's TV Podcast. We positioned ourselves by having a great program and taking advantage of opportunities when they present themselves and creating different models. So one other example of that is in 2008, there was a big crisis, and law firms were losing money, and everybody was freaking out, yeah. charitable giving down, everybody was... And we said, well, what if companies and law firms, none of them wanted to pay full freight for fellowship anymore? So we were afraid we were going to have a dramatic loss in fellowships. And we proposed law firms and companies teaming up together and sharing the cost of a fellowship. And that was a bumper product. <laughs> I mean, everybody wanted that one. <laughs> That's my friend David Stern. For 25 years, David was the executive director of Equal Justice Works, a nonprofit that provides fellowships to law students, law school professionals, lawyers and advocates so that they can start or continue their career in public interest law. Under David's leadership, Equal Justice Works facilitated over 2,500 fellowships, growing the organization from a niche law school student association in the mid-90s to a nationally recognized leader in connecting lawyers who are passionate about public interest law with the opportunity to work on important causes ranging from disaster relief to criminal justice reform and so much more. In this episode, David shares how he found his passion for public interest law, the process of building Equal Justice Works, and what he learned along the way about leadership, fundraising, program development, and branding throughout his career. Thanks so much for tuning in. I did want to start, David, with uh, hearing about your childhood. Where did you grow up, and what was your early education like, and what was your family like? So I grew up in Washington, D.C., and I had two very progressive liberal parents who were activists. Um, my father, who had had a career in public service, um, both in government, working for a senator, a House member, worked in the State Department, but then became an author, and he wrote books critical of the government. And the tax system, for example, that favored the rich, and just the name of the book, he wrote this book twice. One was called The Great Treasury Raid, um, and then the second time, The Rape of the Taxpayer. And it basically described how billionaires were getting away without paying any taxes mm. while everyone else was having to make up for that, and just the unfairness of that. He also wrote books about how congressional campaigns are financed and how that beholdens congressmen to their donors. And it's just, it's not a good thing for our system. So he was kind of a, a whistleblower, um, muckraker, somebody who really wanted to expose problems in the systems and come up with solutions, possible problems. And so what are your like early memories of him like being exposed to that as a child? Was he like schooling you from a very early age on that sort of? Our dining room table, and my, I should tell you about my mother also yeah. first, and then we can talk a little bit about what that dynamic was like. So my mother was also an activist. Before it was in vogue to criticize the Vietnam War, she was out there protesting and actually taking on people who were dinner guests. You know, my parents would have over very famous Washingtonians to their house, and she'd be right in their face saying, like, this is outrageous. How can this government be doing this? And these were the very politicians who were actually making this war happen. So, you know, she was really, she was also an activist and, and willing to speak her mind to power. Um, and she ended up going and working in an orphanage down in Mexico for several years. And she wrote a, a memoir that I thought was fascinating. At age 40, she's living in a huge mansion in Washington, D.C., has her 40th birthday on a tennis court with a laser sculpture and all these, you know, remarkable paper mache sculptures all around this tennis court with the who's who in Washington, D.C. in attendance. And then 10 years later, she's in an orphanage in Mexico without any of those kind of um, power symbols or anything, just serving. And so that kind of tells you a little bit about my parents and the DNA that I think I inherited from them. Um, and, of course, when I was young, my father was definitely a big player in Washington, D.C. He knew all of the you know, prominent leaders. Um, in fact, when I saw the movie The Post, um, talking about um, the Washington Post during the 1960s and you would see in 70s, I, I kept on looking for my parents because I kept on thinking they're going to be here any minute now because they would go to all those parties. So on the one hand, they were relevant, they were players, and on the other hand, they were absent parents. So I was largely raised by help. 
a woman in particular, Blois Hunley, um, was really the primary caregiver for us kids. So I'd say mm, twice a week or three times a week we might have fam a family dinner, but most of the time, us kids, we would eat in the kitchen before the parents would have their folks over or they'd be going out for dinner parties in other parts of the city. Wow, so they're real like socialites, like Washingtonians. 100%. Interesting. But also in a liberal kind of view. So I'll give you two right. really funny examples um, of them hosting interesting parties. So there, were, there was a time when some of the big prominent bands wanted to start giving money away. They wanted to increase their social conscience and, and philanthropy. So the band Chicago uh, came over to our house and the Beach Boys, separate occasions, but they came over and it was like a salon dinner where we had Ralph Nader and lots of congressmen and other people who would come and share, here are some of the progressive things that are happening in the world to give them a little exposure to some of the policy and systemic reform efforts that were taking place. So that was actually something I love that my parents were doing is trying to think about leveraging how do we take what we know and introduce it to people who don't know because we might interest them in getting involved in those kinds of causes? At what point did you gain an appreciation for what they were doing? Because I, I imagine at the time, if you're really young, it's hard to like understand that. You're so right, Ryder. I don't think I really fully understood it until much later in life. And looking back, I just appreciated how they um, how they were strategic and thoughtful about it. Because if I, this is again, the illusions of a child. So I grew up in a super privileged household, um, inherited a lot of wealth from a prior generation. My great grandfather, mm -hmm. Julius Rosenwald, was the person at Sears that really built the company into the behemoth it became. It was a very small operation when he started and then it grew to something really huge. And he gave away a lot of money to support schools for African Americans in the South, more than 5,000 schools. And these were really the only opportunities for education for these kids. And it was just, it's an amazing story. There's a documentary about it. Um, and I, I really am so inspired by him and his example. Now, those are the things that when you're a child, you don't know and you don't appreciate. So I'm living in this big mansion, tennis court, swimming pool, and I'm assuming. Well, everybody has that. <laughs> you know? Like when I'd have friends over, I could see their eyes widen as they would walk in this house. And I'm like, this is what I've always known. It doesn't feel unusual to me. It feels like home. And to them, it was out of this world. That house that I grew up in is now the Chinese ambassador's residence. Um, and I remember when I was in sixth grade, I believe, is when my father sold that house. And there was a front page story in the style section. And classmates and their parents saw it. They saw, oh, and there's, you know, David. So I walked in with this incredible embarrassment, you know, like, oh, my God, my parents just sold this mansion. The attention that that brought to me and my family always made me feel very uncomfortable and wanting to be anonymous about the wealth that we had. Interesting. Wow. That uh, I'm just can only imagine as as a child when you like come to that realization of like first it's normal and then you're you're trying to be humble in a place where you literally can't you have no control over it that's exactly how i felt and it was both a surprise but again an embarrassment it was something where i did not want to be judged based on the wealth that my family had and the discomfort and not even a realization of what that really was and what that meant other than it got a lot of people kind of whispering and talking behind my back and looking at me a little differently. You know, my dad actually described having wealth as being a bit of a burden in that you never know when you're seeing somebody, whether they're talking to you authentically or they're talking to you with a motive for something that they want money you know they want you to make a grant or something like that they'll laugh at your jokes a little louder than they might otherwise boy you're looking awfully good today <laughs> you know to my dad or things like that that he'd always be like oh my gosh i how can i not know whether or not somebody's speaking to me authentically or speaking to me with motivation yeah i heard a quote recently that this is someone who very quickly came into money but 
he observed that money doesn't change you, but it changes everyone around you. Yes. Is what you're saying. It's, it's true. Of, it's true. And it can be. And again, I certainly will never claim because it's given me enormous privilege and opportunity. But I have seen how money can really injure people um, and compromise their growth, their maturity, this you know, kind of reliance on the money. And it, it changes some of their ethic and effort. Uh, in the world, so it can be a really bad thing. Um, but in my case, I really felt like it was such an incredible blessing and such an opportunity. And so, when did you start to kind of forge your own identity as a re- reaction to or, or somehow a rejection of what privilege you started with? I mean, was that happening in high school already, or did it happen in college? A little bit in high school. So my parents had a terrible divorce and, ba- and sent me off to boarding school with one day's notice. I didn't. <laughs> I literally was told, you're going to boarding school tomorrow. And I went and saw my friends and sobbed, and this was in the middle of ninth grade. And then sure enough, my father took me up to a fabulous school. But at the time, I didn't appreciate it. But as it turned out, it was a great school for me. Very challenging. Well, it was a different model that really fit with who I was. I'm a total ADHD kid and have a lot of energy and easily distracted. And the school I went to was called a Cambridge School, and it has a similar model to what Colorado College has, where you study one subject intensely each month, and then each month you change to a different subject. So you might study math for one month for three hours a day, and then you'd have another class. So you'd take an art class or a philosophy class or something like that. And then the next month you'd study history intensively for that month. So for me, rather than trying to juggle five classes, this allowed me to really immerse myself in one subject, and that was perfect for a kid like me. So it turned out to be magical. This was really uh, my best of, col- of high school, college, and law school. High school was really the best. Wow. I mean, just the way you describe it, it sounds so much more logical as a way to learn than the system we have. <laughs> well, in life, you know, you do have to juggle a lot of things. So on True. the one hand, school does prepare yeah. you for that, but on the other hand, just in terms of learning, I felt the stress of trying to juggle these different classes and have my mind have to shift between different subjects super hard. I just found it really difficult. And so I never really thrived in the school where I had to juggle all those things. And once I get into the school, I just, I, I, it was perfect. It was perfect for me. Yeah, I mean, I just thinking about my experience was like going from, you know, English to history to science to math by the time i got to fifth period spanish forget it like right. i've switched so many times already there's no way that i'm going to be able to conjugate these vowels it's like so different from what i was doing in the other classes so and that was my experience as well right and so this school was an antidote to right. that and i i still am a huge believer in that approach i'm not saying it's for everyone but certainly it was perfect for me So when I was in high school, I started to have a lot. I was very different from all the other kids. Most of the other kids loved to smoke pot and go off into the woods. And it was part boarding school, part day school. This is like 70s or 80s? 1974 to 78. Okay. So um, I I was a little bit more straight-laced. I mean, still to this day, I'm a collared shirt kind of guy. I'm more conservative in that score. I had kind of longer hair, but not really crazy long. I had hair that was kind of more bushy. And my thing was, if my hair is a distraction to the ideas that I'm expressing, if my looks are distracting people, well, I don't want to do that. I want to be where I can express far out ideas and, you know, try to be an advocate for different things without my appearance distracting from those ideas. So I kind of was a little bit more of a conformist in that sense um, and became a board member even while I was a student at that school, a board member of the high school, and I loved it. I really enjoyed you know, government. I loved the transparency stuff that they did at that school where all decisions, including punishment of kids, was talked about in the whole community. It was really powerful, and it made me think, wow, this is something I really enjoy. But I still was known because it's a high school that's really exclusive boarding school. And I had a car with me, which immediately everyone knew, oh, you know, he's got enough money so that his family's given him a car at school. That I still had that kind of wealth thing around me. When I went to college, I really was determined to be completely anonymous. 
Like, no one would know my background. No one would know my parents. My parents were not at all involved in helping me choose a college or anything. They didn't drop me off in college. So it's kind of a, an example of a difference from today, from then, where it was like, you know, on your own, going off there, but it allowed me to create my own identity. And that was a good thing for me. It really gave me confidence that people were judging me for me and not for wealth or anything else. So that really was when you were 18, basically, mm -hmm. and showing up at Union College. Tell me about that experience. Was there notable professors, experiences, people, other students? So I would say Union College was good, not great for me. I would say I developed some of the best friendships of my life, and I'm still super close with a handful of other people who, yeah, who were wow. like my best friends. And um, so on that score, it was fantastic. It also definitely gave me an appetite for the law. I had a couple of classes that really made me go, wow, this is something that I care a lot about. I read books that m inspired me, a book called Simple Justice. I'm um, talking about the r road to Brown versus Board of Education and the steps that were taken. I was like, these guys were brilliant, strategic, thoughtful about the steps that they could take in order to reform a really bad decision, Plessy versus Ferguson. And I was just, you know, inspired. Um, and I remember having feelings of like, this is something I would like to do. I like argument. I like debate. Um, in fact, I'll tell you one little side story, which, of course, <laughs> this is our dinner table today. I was going to tell you about our dinner table before, but our dinner table today, which actually resembles my dinner table growing up, you know, full of discussion, full of debate. There's hardly a moment for si of silence. When other people come to the, our dinner table, it's hard to get a word in because everyone's talking over each other, interrupting each other. It's very dynamic. And at one point, one of my kids said, you know, would you guys stop arguing? You know, you guys are like, it looks like you're fighting. It's like, no, we're not fighting. We're lawyers. <laughs> we love talking about these ideas. We love each other the same, even though it sounds like we're disagreeing with each other violently. <laughs> <laughs> but or adamantly it's not really violently but even though we're having these you know intense discussions it's all with love and we this is how we are trained and this is what we like to do so it's sometimes to an outsider it looks pretty heated but to us it's natural comfortable and is actually is more interesting than if it were kind of the more staid table where everyone is is quiet in our when my childhood lots of policy discussions at the table I was really fortunate because in addition to all the things I told you about my dad, one big part of my upbringing was philanthropy. Being part of a family foundation at a very young age. I mean, I'm talking 10 years old, 11 years old. I was in the room. I was not a board member, but I was in the room where we had a chance to hear some of the most incredible progressive leaders come in with an idea or a proposal to present to that board. And it just infected me. I was so inspired by these young, young and sometimes older leaders who had these brilliant ideas about how to reform the system. You know, it came from things like the FBI surveillance of citizens and creating these unknown secret parts of the agency that were really designed to spy on domestic citizens. And, you know, the, the fact that you had these amazing lawyers who discovered this, which you have to say, I remember everyone having this feeling of like, this can't be our government that's doing this, and sure enough, it was. So having those people uncover it, discover it, and then create some safeguards and guardrails to stop that from happening, that's the kind of stuff that I really was inspired by, systemic wow. reform kinds of things. So as a young kid, I got to see a lot of that stuff and learn from my parents about what makes for good grant making. Mm. The number one criteria, which now you'll see the through line to my work at Equal Justice Works, is betting on hot people. Betting on people more than betting on proposals. Because people send in to foundations beautifully written proposals. They're really extraordinary. And we would all vote generally based on the proposals that we got. We would vote in our book which ones we were most excited about. And then you'd meet the people, and the scores would change dramatically from those first impressions of the proposal versus the can-do-itness, resilience, tenacity, 
drive of the applicant. And when, they, when we met them, which again was a unique feature of this foundation, is that we would meet with the finalists, the ones who were going to, you know, who were most likely going to get the grants. And then we, after we met them, then we would decide on what kinds of grants they would get. And let me tell you, those interviews made all the difference in the world. And it sounds a lot like entrepreneurship. And often folks say something to the effect of it's the jockey, not the horse. You know, it could be a great idea, but who's the one who's really going to make it happen? And do they have the tenacity and everything else needed to realize and the vision? Yeah. And, and life experience. That's right. the other thing is when you hear people who come in, I mean, I'll, I'll never forget we had a few proposals and one of them was just not that well written. So this is when you were 10 years old? Yeah, maybe a okay. little older, 15, you're, 16 at this point. You're screening these people. Okay, okay. All right. <laughs> and I wasn't right, really screening. School. I was okay. listening. Right. And then later on, I got to actually sit I at see. the table, and I became chair of the board okay. of, that, of that foundation. But um, And this, by the way, was a foundation created by my grandmother, Edith Stern, who was in New Orleans. And she had a family foundation with basically all of her kids and their kids um, who were – you know, invited to join the board. Some did, some didn't. But as we would go through this process, I just remember having that feeling of, wow, the people who come in have had some experience that can really make the difference. So in one case, a proposal was poorly written. The woman comes in. She is an organizer. She is talking about how she gets people on the line to combat consumer fraud. I mean, it's like... you. Telephone companies raising your rates, no consideration. How do they make the decisions about increasing the rates? They're not considering the consumers. This woman stood up and said, you can't do that. And she organized super successfully and stopped these utilities from raising rates. So, you know, the proposal not well written. She got things done. This woman is an accomplished organizer. So that's the kind of stuff that really got me fired up and saying, you know, betting on the person, yeah. judging them in personal interviews more than just their application is the, a really good way to make good philanthropic decisions. Right, because the ideas are, you know, cheap in a sense, but the execution is expensive. It's really hard yeah. to really execute on a vision. It's true, and when you find people who have that bug um, – you know, you, you want to bet on them. So let me yeah. actually tell you, I'm going to flash forward a sure. few years. So when my dad died, there was some money left over in his estate, and he gave it to a foundation, or a smaller foundation, not the one that my grandmother created. And he asked that we bring together members of my immediate family, actually, so my siblings, so his kids. So we have five kids in our family. So each one was invited. Only one wanted to join, but he also said, I want to have Ralph Nader, a guy who ran um, Public Citizen Litigation Group, Alan Morrison, another guy who ran the Health Research Group at Public Citizen, Sid Wolf, to come together and to help make decisions about how this money was going to go. So we got together, and again, l I'm just now looking back, a bunch of white people, but very aligned in terms of what things that they were passionate about and an appreciation of systemic reform and also wanting to carry on this legacy that my dad had established about corporate or government accountability. So we're all in the room together. And Ralph said, you know, one thing that would be really powerful is if we would give large grants, $100,000 grants, to a few individuals who have a good idea and they want to get it started but they never can get the critical mass to, to start that idea. So we know a ton of people who are number twos in organizations, and they have a brilliant idea. They have the experience. They know what, what they're doing. And yet when they reach out to foundations, they get small $15,000 grants. They're never assembled at the same time. They're busy doing their job. They can never get the critical mass to jump. And we said this fund can launch these public interest pioneers to go off and launch these new organizations. So we did this, and we had these super low barriers to entry, three-page concept paper and your resume. Here, give us your idea. And then we had actually the founder of NAPEL, founder of you know Equal Justice Works, Michael Cotafagan was our executive director, 
And he would screen all these and narrow it down to here are the ones that we think you should look at. So we got it down to you know usually five or ten, and then we'd invite them for a more full-blown proposal. The projects that we launched through this public interest pioneer program, truly breathtaking. I was just talking to one of those board members, Sid Wolf, just a week ago, and we were both you know giving each other high fives about how the heck did we know to support, for example, organizers in New York, you know, individual workers, no collective power, right? They are all working their jobs. They're either temporary workers, they have individual jobs, and they have no bargaining power. And she organized them to purchase health insurance as a collective and bringing the rates way down. I mean, that's the kind of, that's a brilliant idea. And when you met her, it was like, that's who we want to bet on. You know, Martha Bergmark, who ran, created the Mississippi Center for Justice, who, you know, is super successful and launched that organization in part because of this public interest pioneer grant. Another guy named Greg Leroy, he was doing a project around clawbacks. So when a company says, I want to locate in your state, they often get incentives. Yeah. The state will give them a tax break or some reason to do it, always with the promise of, if you let us settle here, we're going to create a thousand jobs. And well, many times they don't create those jobs. So Greg Leroy created a whole organization focused on clawbacks, which is if you promise to make a, you know this many jobs or create this many jobs in this community and you don't do it, well then you got to give the tax break back. I love this guy and I love the work and it's still going on today. Good jobs first. I I think this guy is absolutely brilliant. But it, we just launched a lot of these young, relatively young people who needed that critical amount of money to make the jump and super successful. Yeah, so like seed funding, essentially. Yeah. It, and large enough right. chunks to really make it happen. Whereas my tendency, even now in my philanthropy, is to give lots of little grants to a lot of organizations that I love and I want to support and I want to be among the community that supports them versus what we did then, which was the very large strategic grant to one or two people and really giving them a chance to launch something new, which was cool, That's really so cool. cool. But also a generation, the reason why I was bringing it up is that is kind of a new iteration of what my parents had instilled in us about betting on people, giving them an opportunity to make their dreams come true. Amazing. Um, I want to take it back to law school um, and hear about what inspired you to take that direction. I mean, it sounds like you had a lot of exposure to policy and politics and philanthropy. What was it about the law that got you really excited? Yeah, so I think um, growing up in the family that I did, uh, th I think there was a real appreciation that the law was something that was a strategic way to make systemic change. And so listening to the policy discussions that we would have around the dining room table, it always really came around to, can we change the law on this? You know what? And of course, there were some litigation strategies I heard about at that foundation that always got me fired up. I was like, oh my God, I really want to do this work. So law school and, and then in college, reading about these cases and things that just made me go like, this, this is my cup of tea. This is what I want to do. So when I finished college, um, and I regret this, I went right away to law school. I really regret having not taken some time off to actually get in the field and do work. I encourage every law student today to take a break before going to law school to just, you know, go and see what practicing law is like. It's not what you think it is. It's not how it's portrayed on television. It's a lot of grinding, a lot of really, and especially as a young lawyer, oh my gosh, you've got to pay your dues. Um, as a public interest lawyer, you're often thrown in the deep end of the pool. But as a lawyer in regular private practice, or even government service, you're often given less responsibility and have to just grind through a lot of papers. And it's not glamorous or fun. Um, and in fact, so uh, when I graduated from law school, I clerked for two federal judges and then went to a small private firm. And I hated it. So the judge who I worked for said, I know you want to do public interest work, but you, first you got to learn how to be a lawyer. So who was the best lawyer that we saw this year? And I said, oh, this guy, Ben Rosenberg, he was fantastic. He said, yeah, and you're going to go work for Ben. And then you're going to learn how to do this, and then you can go do your public interest work. So I did that for six months and 
hated it. I just I felt like I wasn't learning anything. I was doing work, but I I would wake up in the morning. I'd say, and even now I look back, I don't remember which side we represented on a dispute. Were we the landlord or were we the tenant? <laughs> I don't <laughs> remember. Um, so it just was meaningless, and it was like this is exactly why I did not go to law school. I really wanted to have passion. So then an, a law firm in Washington, D.C., Burnaby and Katz, two women lawyers, were looking to hire their first associate, and I was that guy. And these two women, civil rights law firm, these two women were tenacious, and they, you know, again, taking on the most ambitious cases. Just the three of us against gigantic companies. We were so overmatched. They'd have huge firms that would devote full-time people to compete to fight us and we were doing and again the insanity of this is like we would do a motion in a day from start to finish research get the affidavits do all that we need to do in one day normally this is a many week long process but it would be like david brief do this afternoon go to the library <laughs> here's what we need <laughs> and off i'd go and i'd do it but my point is, is that after two years of this, righteous as it was, and I love the clients, um, Debbie Katz actually emerged, and both of them are still practicing really important law. Debbie Katz has become a very prominent civil rights lawyer doing gender discrimination work, among others, a lot of civil rights work. She was actually Dr. Blasey Ford's lawyer in the Kavanaugh uh, confirmation hearings. Uh, amazing. I'm just, I watch her with such admiration as to what kind of law she's done. But I, my realization during that time working with them is that we were super successful in getting all these cases resolved before trial. They'd always settle. And I was like, I could be doing this my whole life, and the law is not going to change. Mm. There's not going to be a precedent set. We're going to help individual clients, and it will be very satisfying to get people who were done wrong, get them some compensation, get them some remedy. But that's not why I went to law school. I wanted something bigger. And I also felt like we were overmatched and we were such an under-resourced organization. So when I heard about NAPIL, the National Association for Public Interest Law, which be became Equal Justice Work, and this idea of mobilizing an army of lawyers to do public interest work, I was highly motivated. I was like, that is exactly what we need. So I was, I was really excited about that and it turned out to be the best job I could ever imagine. Wow, uh, that is such a cool transition that you're talking about from being this in this sort of David and Goliath situation to like how do we become the Goliath on the other side of the table? Yeah, well and I don't know that we ever thought that we'd become the Goliath because the, the powers are so strong but just create Fair a enough. lot of Davids, a lot of stone throwers. <laughs> and we did. I really do think we just, we, we have launched the careers of so many young lawyers, and it's probably the greatest joy is seeing what they have become. I mean, last night I ran into a lot of former fellows at this um, Southern Center for Human Rights dinner, and it was just so inspiring to hear what they're doing, see what they've accomplished, see their leadership. It's just, it's really, it's awesome. I want to talk about the uh, experience you had clerking just mm. for another moment. Sure. So it was in Baltimore. This is now like mid 80s. Yes. So 80s. what was going on? Paint me a picture for that job and that scene. What was the work that you were doing? What were the cases? So it may not be as exciting as you think it is, <laughs> but um, what was happening, there were the judges. I worked for two different judges. So the first one was a senior judge. His name was Rosal Thompson. So he was in his 80s, and he had slowed down. He had a very low docket, very few cases. But the benefit of that is that he would assign his law clerk to go and work for the other judges on the court. So I got a chance. Normally, you work with one judge. You know that judge really well, but that's it. In this case, I had a chance to work with five different district court judges and get to know them. And that was a huge advantage. I think every law clerk, when they heard about this, they were like, wow, that's an ideal clerkship because you really are getting to hear the different considerations of different judges as they're making decisions. You get to see a much wider variety of matters rather than the single docket of that one judge. Mm -hmm. And as a result of my rotating among these different judges, one of the judges said, well, what are you doing next year? And I said, well, I don't know. I think I'm finished and going to go start practicing. Well, you know, how about come and clerk for me? for an, another year. So I did that. 
and um, this was a Republican African American judge. On his commission paper that he had mounted in his office, there was a little stain on it. He says, yeah, that's the stain of Ronald Reagan's tear as he's signing my commission. <laughs> <laughs> but he was a former US a assistant U.S. attorney, and he was, I think, uh, number two in that office. And he had a very pro-prosecutorial view. Mm. And I think this was a wake-up call to me about my privilege and my liberal views. He was very tough on especially um, drug crimes. He had, we had one gigantic conspiracy. So if you've seen The Wire, yeah, that's based in Baltimore. So same, exactly th those stories that you see in that was happening, and we saw those cases in our court. Very large conspiracies, huge amounts of money, and catching these very young people who were organizing these drug gangs. And... Um, the judge, at the end of one of these cases, um, one of the drug leaders, you know, he sent him to 40 or 50 years in jail. And I was like, I was shaking my head. I walked in the back, and he's like, come here. Uh, you got to come in here into my chambers. we got to talk for a minute. And I'm like, Judge, how could you do that? This guy's 25 years old. He, he will never see the light of day. This is just how – that's such a long time. Can you imagine 50 years? He said, David, I grew up in this town. I know what these drugs do to our community. These people who are selling the drugs, they're preying on sick people, people who have no control, and they're taking their money, taking their lives. They're destroying the lives in our community. They need to pay a price. We need to make sure that they do not ever do this again. They can live high on the hog while they're having their you know, heyday, fancy cars, fur coats, all that, and then there's a reckoning. And when they come in front of me, that's what they're going to get. And it really was such a different perspective on the same facts. It really gave me an appreciation that I had lived in this kind of liberal era, you know, upbringing where I thought long sentences are a bad thing, not recognizing people's ability to change and get better. And, and instead, he had a very, very strong uh, opinion that if you do that kind of wrong in a community, then you're going to pay a really severe price. Mm. And he also had a lot of credibility because African-American and who had grown up in the community, he had a very different perspective. So it really, it was quite influential on me because I was always thinking like, gosh, there's a different perspective than the one that I've got, you know, from my upbringing. Same facts, but a very different interpretation of them. So when you reflect back on that now, or maybe even at the time, were you still seeing injustice in that were you were you like torn what was your reaction and how did that kind of form your own kind of next decade i think i understood it i understood his reasoning better but i still thought it was wrong and one of the things that came about while i was clerking which is actually a very it's too long for us to go into but sentencing guidelines yeah which was something to basically try to make sure that judges are more consistent. So if you would look at our small, tiny court in Baltimore of the federal judges, and they would have in their reports that the probation officers would give in making recommendations about um, what sentence they should get, you'd see a very wide disparity. You'd see for the same defendant, similar circumstances, same amount of drugs, or if it's a bank robbery, same amount of money being stolen, you would see vastly different sentences. One might get a year, another one might get 50 years. Now, how is it that a defendant, just by luck of the draw of which judge you get, gets such disparate sentences? So I thought the sentencing guidelines were a good thing to try to regulate and make it a little bit more consistent. On the other hand, I saw how individual judges would try to take into account unique circumstances of a case and be constrained by these sentencing guidelines. You're talking about mandatory minimums? They weren't mandatory minimums. These were something that was created um, to try to reduce the disparity in sentencing so that people would have similar sentences for similar crimes. Mandatory minimums were like more like the three strikes rule and things like that where people would get um, – or for a crime, you're going to get this sentence. This was a little different than that. This was a kind of if you put these formulas, the in, if you put these factors into a formula, you'll come up with a certain sentence. And judges ought to use these sentencing guidelines to help them 
reach that conclusion, and then every judge on the same court should have the same sentence at the end of this process. Mm. And so a mandatory minimum could be just another one of those parts of the equation? A mandatory minimum is generally in state courts, and they were, so a different system altogether okay, than the federal, right. and they would have things where they would look at aggravating circumstances and mm. condi- and particular crimes, and they'd say, for that, you have to have a minimum sentence of this. That was something that really did take hold. And this, the very thing you're pointing out, led to mass incarceration mm. and you know, a lot of problems, of course, with the theory being if you make the sentences long enough, then that's going to deter people from committing those crimes. And that just n- did not happen. It just simply meant that we incarcerated just a massive amount of people. So where was your heart in those days? Were you seeing that 50-year sentence and being like, what am I doing? What am I a part of? Or Absolutely. I, I knew right then and there this is like, this is an injustice. This is something that really bothers me. And seeing the disparity in sentences bothered me. I also recognize that giving some latitude to judges to depart from those guidelines was really important because there were some circumstances where you'd say like, well, that, that sentence does not make sense for this particular defendant. So I, I saw it kind of multiple ways, but I certainly thought the sentences that the judges were giving, my judge in particular was giving, were way too long. And I, um, yeah, I definitely walked out going like, I would never be that judge. <laughs> <laughs> so... Tell me about uh, Napil. Is that Napil? Napil. Napil. Did you call it Napil or Napil? That's <laughs> what it was called. I have to tell you, it's a funny story because so the organization actually came. There was a predecessor organization called the Equal Justice Foundation, and this was something where several people got together and they said, "Let's raise a lot of money and support law students doing public interest summer internships." And that organization failed, like immediately. Uh, a couple of years, okay. not long. And this guy, Michael Caudill Fagan, was working at U.S. Public Interest Research Group, U.S. Perg, and he said, I know I can make this work. I know there's a better formula and a better approach to this. I know I can do it. So he went and talked to everybody who was involved in the prior iteration and figured out, oh, I see. And he came up with some brilliant ideas about how to do this. So there are a constellation of a lot of these student groups on campuses that were supporting public interest-minded students. And so the students would raise money from other students to support those students doing public interest work. But it varied dramatically. Harvard, Yale, NYU, great programs, raised a boatload of money, gave away lots of internships. Well, those are already the most well-endowed schools in the country. Mm -hmm. Other schools were struggling to put together $1,000, $2,000 to pay for one student to go and spend a summer doing public interest work. So Michael Caudill Vagan said, together we're much more powerful than we are as these individual chapters. So let's create an association, a national association for public interest law, NAPIL, and let's create this association of these student groups and let's help them raise more money. Let's teach them almost a cookie cutter approach to how to do this better and it was phenomenal and Michael again went and slept on couches in every law school around the country and grew it from seven groups to 120 groups in the first five years and oh my god and when you hear him talk about it just the inspiration and his dedication to making it happen it just it it lights your fire you just go like wow this is a germ of an idea, and he went and made it happen just through pure will and effort and going around and, again, putting out a little carrot that everybody was like, oh, I want to do this. Probably the most brilliant idea that he had, because you have such disparity in resources, is he said, how about this? We'll go to the biggest law firms in the country, and depending on how many associates they hire, we'll ask them to contribute a certain amount to a common fund and we'll redistribute that money out to all the student groups in the country that belong to NAPIL. So Harvard used to go to the big law firms. Harvard's the student group. would go to the big law firms and would say, hey, can you give us money to support summer public interest internships? And Yale would do the same, and Columbia, and NYU, and Stanford, and all the schools where the biggest firms would interview. So the firms were like, oh my god, we got to pay each one of these student groups. But now, with NAPIL, one contribution 
supports all the groups, so the law firms loved it. Student groups were a little less happy that some of their money was going away. But, <laughs> but Michael also came up with a strategy, which was, so for every student group that became a member of NAPIL, they would get back more money than they paid in dues. So if they paid, and he did a staggered membership dues schedule, wealthier schools paid more. Than, but no matter what, if $2,000 was the maximum dues Harvard paid, they'd get $4,000 back. So why wouldn't they join? And then they created these cookbooks. I call them cookbooks. Basically, how do you raise money from students? Because almost everybody was doing this raising money on campuses. So they did tithing campaigns. If you're going to go and work for a law firm, give 1% of your salary to support another student doing public interest work. They would get professors to do auctions of different things, a lecture, a dinner at their home, all these different things. And it raised the money from about $300,000 to $3 million in five years. Wow. Yeah, it was an extraordinary growth because of sharing kind of best practices. Some schools would exchange um, ideas. So at an auction, school in Los Angeles would say, you know, Hollywood is, you know, Hollywood. But if you give tickets to shows in New York, we probably could auction that off for a lot of money because <laughs> some of our alums would actually make that trip. So they would exchange kind of um, items for the auctions, something that Fordham would want from L.A. and something that L.A. would want from Fordham, you know. So they would swap projects and raise more money, each love, of them. Love the creativity there. It was so good. I mean, there's a lot of creativity throughout that entire story you just told me. Um, and it's a great example of like, well, there was a nugget of a good idea, but it really needed a phenomenal leader to execute on it. So, Ryder, I agree with you 100%. And the piece that, again, I look at that era where it was no, but th you know, staff of three, five people. I mean, it was tiny. But the creativity, using volunteers to write these cookbooks, disseminating this information, anybody who got involved with the organization at that time, they were like, wow. Who, like, it was discovery. In fact, the woman who was at the Ford Foundation, who gave one of the first grants to the organization, kept on saying to everybody, this is the single best organization I give money to. I give a little bit of money, and they turn it into a ton. You know, the high leverage, high impact work of supporting this organization was really powerful. So you were what, 26, 27 after you finished your clerkship and then found out, well, you said you were at another smaller public interest firm for a year or two. Right. And so then how old were you and where were you when you got involved? So I got involved in 92, so I was 33, 32, 32 years old. My wife and I, when we got married, we decided to travel around the world for a year uh, before having kids and before our next gig. So I left that public interest law firm, Berna Bank Katz. My wife was working at a very large law firm in New York. And about halfway through our travels, we were like, we're not going back to those jobs. <laughs> 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 and so when we came back to D.C., I was saying, I think i got to go work on the Hill. i got to do something policy, something yeah. bigger impact. And I was walking down the street and ran into Ralph Nader's number two person, a guy named John Richard. And John said, hey, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm looking, I'm trying to figure out. And he says, oh, my God, I have got the perfect job for you. Have you ever heard of this organization called NAPIL? I'm like, no. <laughs> I don't even know what that stands for. What's a NAPIL? <laughs> and uh, he said, I'm going to introduce you to the head of it. So I went home, and there was a message on my machine already from the head of it saying, John Richard says I need to talk to you, so can, we, can you come in and see me? So I went in and met with then the executive director, Kathleen Welch, and she told me about this idea of the fellowship program, which was they were just getting launched because all those students who had had their summer public interest internships, they wanted to do it once they graduated. They were bitten by the bug. No jobs. No jobs for them. So this idea of how can we create a launch pad for them right after they graduate from law school, and that was really the idea around these fellowships, and we had some amazing good fortune in that a judge in Chicago had leftover funds from a big antitrust case and sent those to equal justice work. It totaled two judges, $3.1 million. But she said, I'm not going to give it to a bunch of students because that was our governing board. In order to, I need some grown-ups. 
So we got some really prominent leaders in the profession, prominent judges, general counsel of companies, prominent lawyers from big law firms, and public interest people, all to sit around a table and decide how to give that money away. There was no fundraising involved at that point. It was just, we have $3.1 million that we can give away. So the judge's discretion on how to use that money is common or normal? Or? No, this is a, it's a, I don't want to do too much of a tangent, but there's something called the Cypre Doctrine, okay. which is when there's, in, especially in an antitrust case, the first thing you do is you say, bad guy, you got to put in all your ungain, uh, you know, your illegitimate profits yeah. into the kitty. Right. People who have been harmed, come in here and make your case as to why you've been harmed and by how much. Mm-hmm. And after those claims have been paid, sometimes there's money left over. Mm. And the judge has to make a decision. What do I do with this leftover money? How, who do I give it to? I can't hold on to it. So the first judge who had this case said, well, it's a folding carton case. I mean, there aren't any aligned interests or parties that look like folding carton companies or consumers. So he was really at a loss and finally he said, I'll fund an antitrust research group. It's an antitrust case. That seems Makes like sense. it's in keeping with the underlying case. And the Seventh Circuit said no. The, the, his boss, basically, the court above him, said, nope, you can't do that. Sent it back down. He said, I don't know what else to do. Maybe you didn't like the one antitrust group that I picked. I'll give it to a law school to do research on antitrust. And the, again, the boss, the Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit said, no, we told you once, we're telling you again, you can't do that with this money, and transferred it to another judge. And that judge, Ryder, you know this judge because she's been at our dinner many times, and Claire Williams, mm. the judge who has sometimes sung from yeah, the stage. Yeah, of course. So she was a district court judge. She inherited this case. She said, my law clerks want to go and do public interest work. There are no jobs for them. I want to find an organization that will support them. This was shortly after Skadden had created a fellowship program, so she learned as much as she could about that program, and then she searched the country for an organization and found this group of students and run by you know Michael Caudill Fagan and then Kathleen Welch, and she said, okay, this is the organization that I want to give the money to, but I'm not going to give it to students. I need a grown-up board. So she helped pick some of these leading lawyers to give the money away, and that's when I was hired was to get this going. But going back to the interview, when I had the conversation with Kathleen, when I heard about this idea, I was like, this is just what's needed. I've been in the trenches. We need an army of lawyers. That's what this is all about. The talent is unbelievable of people who want to do this work. And so I was really excited. And Kathleen saw that exuberance and was like, that's too (laughs) too excited. (laughs) Tone it down, David. (laughs) Tone it down. You're a little too excited. You also are like, you know, very much of a give it to me. I can run with this. I know how to do it. And she was like, that is just not how we do business here. We're collaborative. We're not going to give it to somebody. No. So she said, thanks so much for coming in, but that's a, you know, no go. And so I went back, ate some humble pie, called her up and I said, look, I'd love a do-over. I know I came across really strong. It's just because of my excitement and enthusiasm for the (laughs) idea. Give me another chance. And so she did. And I went and I had another conversation with her. And happily, she says, you know, one of the best decisions that she made was to hire me to help create the fellowship program. Wow. I love that answer. <laughs> I mean, that's hilarious. I like, yeah. So there's overexcitement that totally. turned that's, her off. And I think you've seen that in me. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about that later for sure. But I just love that you had the tenacity and the humbleness and the self-reflection to ask for that second shot. And you really wanted it. So you knew that that was just worth a redo. And I, I toned it down so dramatic. I suppressed a lot of that excitement in order to really understand and show the respect that I had for her and all the work that had been done before. And when I went in there, there was a lot of micromanagement in the beginning where Kathleen was basically channeling my energy into very focused efforts rather than being all over the map. Tremendous. I mean, she's a great leader and a really strategic, smart manager. Um, and so that really helped me shine, but it also made me feel like there's a shadow. She was looking over my shoulder for every decision I'm making. I need a little bit more autonomy. So I almost left mm. after a year. We had a conversation over lunch. I said, I think I'm going. And she said, no, I can change. I can change. And she did. She gave me a lot more runway to do the things that I thought were right for the 
organization and for this program. And uh, yeah, and it was a super successful partnership. And then she announced that she was leaving after three years of uh, running the organization, actually five years. So it was, uh, is that right? I think Michael Caudill Fagan ran it for five years and Kathleen ran it for five years. I had been there three years and was very happy in my lane running the fellowship program. I helped conduct a search for an executive director. Everybody said, well, why aren't you doing it? I'm like, no, I'm happy in my lane. This is perfect. We're growing it. It feels so good. And finally, three board members took me out. Just as we were, I had already lined up. Here's the person who should be the next VD. Um, and we had lunch. And they turned to me and they said, we're not leaving until you agree to take the job. <laughs> 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 and so wow. reluctantly, very reluctantly, I did. I, I took the job as ED. I thought it was a big mistake because I was so good in my lane and I had momentum. Everything felt good. And the idea of adding on management and overall responsibility for the law student organizing part, this big conference we do every year, all these things we're like, oh, I, I think this is going to distract me. Going back to the high school, right? Instead of a single focus, there are going to be too many things to think about. So, but and I took because you were passionate about the exact thing of getting that career opportunity post college that you saw was like critical to the organization at the time. Exactly, I was very convinced that I had the magic bullet. You know, right. I had the thing that was going to make all the difference. And that other stuff, interesting, supportive. I understood why it all fit together. But let me stay on my lane to really build this one piece up because I think it's going to be a game changer. Yeah. I mean, also, just frankly, it's, you know, three years from joining an org to running it. That's not a lot of time. And you're still relatively young at the time to, you know, get that kind of big jump up in responsibilities. But, uh, yeah, tell me about that transition from being, you know, focused on one component and then, what did you learn transitioning to the leadership position? That was uh, honestly still, I go back, my wife and I have, we laugh about this, that we were having nightly management meetings at home <laughs> 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 in addition to what was going on in, in the day just to try to figure out, like, so what's the right move here? And personnel issues, super hard. And always, throughout my entire 30 years, I've found those to be some of the hardest issues. And, um, and then also just... Uh, trying to gain credibility with the board and with I mean, the board was in major transition. Again, this is part of the thing, Ryder, when I look back, this was a time of enormous change in the organization. It was going 100 miles an hour. So you're constantly thinking, uh-oh, we may be going off the road here. You know, we got to make a course adjustment. We've got to align the resources with the top priorities and not get sucked into lots of tangential, seemingly important but not important things. But when you're in the, in the saddle, you think they're important. You really do. So I think I learned a lot about making decisions. I made some really bad personnel decisions. Um, and boy, I paid big prices for those. In fact, we laugh that, um, and I think every executive director has a moment like this maybe not every, but certainly I know a lot who have, where there's this uprising of the staff saying, we don't like something you're doing, and they write a memo, and then they want to have a discussion about it with the whole staff. It's painful. It is emotionally grueling to have those very open conversations where people are saying, we don't like this, and we need it to change. And the memo, again, was detailed, and it, particularly in this instance, I had put somebody who I thought was excellent, I really, I still love this woman, as my number two. Well, that created a distance between me and the staff, and that was a huge adjustment. People did not like that. They did not like the idea that they weren't able to talk directly to me about things. Mm. And I needed to support her and her leadership, so I didn't let them go around her to me on the things where they she made a decision they disagreed with. And that just really upset them. So again, we had conversations. It was really tears, a lot of tears on, on that retreat. Um, and uh, Well, but just yeah. knowing that people had tears at all shows the passion that everyone did probably want to be there. And they believed in the mission and in you and what was, what was happening and the growth that you were experiencing. So, Well, I also, I had a couple of self-revelations, which again, <laughs> is a funny story to think back on. 
So at, at the retreat, and we had somebody who was totally unqualified facilitating this retreat, so that was actually another lesson learned, is that sometimes you put people in a situation where in a normal arrangement, no problem, and then suddenly you throw in a lot of emotion, and if the person doesn't know how to manage that, th she was in over her head in a minute, and you could see, I don't know how to control this. I don't know how to manage these conversations in order to get to any kind of closure. So people mm. left really traumatized from that day. But one thing that happened that day, <laughs> which I have had many laughs about this since, the facilitator said, okay, draw a picture of the organization. So I drew a picture that was a schematic <laughs> 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 of the hierarchy of the organization and how it was positioned. And no one else did that. Everyone yeah. else drew a real picture of like how they were feeling. So, and some were like, how is it now? How do you want it to be? So one person kind of drew this picture of everybody holding hands together all at the same level, different skin color, et cetera. And like, this is how it should be. And of course I looked at that and I was like, no, there's actually a hierarchy yeah. in the organization. Another person wrote, and this is the number two person, had a picture where there was uh, a pit between me and her, me standing on one side with flowers, encouraging her to walk over the pit that had nails on the bottom <laughs> facing up. <laughs> you lured me into this mess, and now I'm getting you know attacked by everybody. Um, another person had um, eyes painted sideways, so paranoid kind of eyes. So all of these pictures, first of all, it showed me that my thinking was so out of sync with everybody else and that I had a very kind of more factual, linear thinking and other people were more emotional and had more, they were describing how they were feeling. And that was a real wake up call for me to be more open to that kind of thinking than I was going into that retreat. Mm. Um, yeah, it, it was dramatic. And that's just, again, one little chapter in a probably three year intensive period of radical change in the yeah. organization and radical growth actually right and that's kind of a lot of parallels again to the private sector of what happens at a startup when you're moving really fast and making a lot of changes and responding to the market and taking advantage of opportunities and making quick decisions to hire people or promote people or whatever it is there's just a lot of um you know tumultuous stuff going on and so many variables and that you think you know where it's going to go and only afterwards do you realize the mistake you made because right. you didn't actually anticipate the other moves that were going to happen on the chessboard yeah. so to speak you know where you go like oh my gosh i didn't realize that would have the implication to that other employee mm -hmm. who would be pissed that this is a new authority given to that person so right. lots of things where i just i did not have the experience to know those mistakes so i learned a lot by doing and experiencing the pain that happened and then saying, okay, that was not a good move, acknowledging it. That was another huge thing I learned was just acknowledging mistakes rather than digging in my heels. I did that a few times. I dug in my heels like I have to assert my authority and that never worked well for me. Um, and there were even recent examples at the very end of my time at Equal Justice Works where I tried to do that and it was not good. Again, I, I had to re reminisce about the earlier days of acknowledge how people are feeling acknowledge mistakes that you m you've made be more transparent and open about what you're you're really thinking about rather than trying to keep it transparent i'm the leader right. i made the decision this is how it's going to go yeah and creating those opportunities for people to be candid and yeah. express themselves whether it's through a drawing or through any other means exactly invite that yeah. welcome it rather than criticize it right so just tell me the yeah. nuts and bolts so we're talking this is like the late 90s and how large is the organization at the time when you were kind of a few years into the job and all this change was happening? So it was, yeah, mid to late 90s, and um, everything is growing, and it's happening all simultaneously. The student groups on campuses are raising more money, and they want more opportunities once they graduate. Again, I confess that I was so focused on postgraduate fellowships. There was an opportunity with AmeriCorps, brand new organ entity that got created by Bill Clinton. And Kathleen Welch, my predecessor, said, here's an opportunity for us to do something. And went to AmeriCorps and said, what about lawyers? And the people who were behind creating AmeriCorps said, lawyers, no. We are about you know college graduates going and doing cleaning up parks and tutoring kids. Lawyers, we don't see it. 
And then we had a call a week later saying, yeah, lawyers. So we went in there and got a pretty large core, 40 lawyers, to be funded through AmeriCorps. So th these are all the kinds of innovations. But I'll, I'll give you just an example of how entrepreneurial we felt. So we had our plate was full. Everyone was at absolute capacity. How many staff? Seven, eight staff. Okay. Full out. Everyone's working weekends, long hours. And Kathleen, then the executive director, comes in and says, you know, there's this opportunity to do something called the Rural Legal Corps. You know, create an opportunity for students to go and spend a summer in rural legal aid programs. But I just don't think we have the capacity to do it. And I was like, like hell we don't. <laughs> So I spent that weekend writing a proposal, kind of developing this thing, and just, you know, it, I just could not think of leaving something on the sidelines that was so in the sweet spot of what we were about. So I think everyone had that attitude of, you know, whatever it takes, and we'll spend whatever hours just so devoted to the organization and making sure that it just didn't miss a chance to do something like that. And that ended up being a great program, one that I still adore, and it died when the funding, federal funding, um, ended for that program. And then many years later, we brought it back to private funding. Mm. Yeah, and just that, uh, you know, operational change from how you approach the government for a project versus a law school or a law firm. I mean, that's just a completely different workflow. I'd love to hear you talk about that. Well, it is probably one of the unique features of Equal Justice Works, NAPIL and Equal Justice Works, is that we really did not get a lot of foundation grants. Almost all of our support, and this is a good thing, was very diverse from lots of different sources. So we weren't dependent on any one of them. You know, this is one of the cardinal rules of nonprofit management is you don't want to be dependent on any single source of support because if it goes away, so does your organization. If you can diversify it so that if any money goes away, it has a, only a minimal effect on the organization and programs, that's a good thing. So I, that was always my focus in the organization was how do we keep on diversifying sources of money? The federal grant was actually a really big risk because it was a new entity, AmeriCorps. We didn't know how lawyers were going to fit. We actually had years later one year where we did not get our funding renewed. That was a moment of total crisis for me. Um, and I did a lot of reflection, and then we came back and won a grant and won another grant in succession, and my board chair at the time said, it's you know, it's how you respond when you get knocked down on the mat. And you guys really picked up the game, came back strong, and doubled the effort that we had before getting knocked down. So it's just it's stories like that that, again, just really totally, it, it brings back fond memories of extra effort, being really smart and strategic, and, um, and advancing the organization, which that, that era in particular just had so much of that going on all at the same time. Yeah, and I'd love to hear about the transition from Napal to... Napal. 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 And think <laughs> about this. So think of you know, this, the city, Naples. You yeah. know, so it's right. like that. But there was a lot of joke when we decided to change the name. So people didn't know. You know, if you were in law school, you knew Napal. Everyone knew Napal. If you were a Napil Fellow, that was your identity. You know, I'm a Napil Fellow. And then our board chair said, I am going around. His name was Greg Landis, and he was the general counsel of AT&T Wireless. He said, I'm going around the country, and I'm trying to promote this organization. I say Napil. People I'm talking to, they were like, what is that? What does it stand for? And he said he would have trouble remembering what it stood for. Is it National Association of Good Guy Lawyers? <laughs> you know, just could not remember what the heck it was, what it stood for. So, um, and then there were jokes about, you know, take a napill at night and you feel better in the morning. And, you know, just, but he said, listen, we at AT&T Wireless, we are always thinking about branding. We should have a name that really does it's easy to remember. People will always think of this organization as that brand. So we had Mickey Cantor, famous um, politician who was the Secretary of Commerce and the Clinton administration and had been very prominent in Democratic circles, and he was on our board. And he said, I know a firm that does name changes, and I will call them and see if they'll do it for free for this organization. I offered $5,000, and they laughed. 
because this was a six-figure right. operation for them. Right. <laughs> and I, of course, was like, five, that's a big deal for me. Yeah. $5,000. Counting every penny. <laughs> every penny. Yeah. So, um, but they were like, oh, my God, you know, this is chump change. This yeah. won't even cover our expenses. Um, but yeah. in any event, they helped us narrow down the field. We had a lot of different considerations. They did a really thorough job. And I think there was initially this whole um, focus around justice works. Yeah. Just on its own, because it really sounded good and tight. And then we did a little polling, and in the African American community in particular, right. justice certainly was not working. Was not working. Yeah. They were Justice Department. We don't like that. We don't think there is any justice in this country. So having the equal in there in front of it changed the polling numbers dramatically. And so we all said, no, this is a better name. So Equal Justice Works came up. We did all the vetting that we needed to do. Again, it went through. And the crazy story is because of that identity that people identify with a, a name, when that got presented to the board after five meetings of really intense study and debate and discussion, the vote w it passed by one vote. And people with hindsight say, how is that possible? Napil, Equal Justice Works, like how the heck could that have happened? And it's the p power of identity with a brand that the people who were passionate about Napil, and there are still people today who are the early Napil Fellows who call themselves Napil Fellows. Wow. They won't change to an Equal Justice Works Fellow. They might say, Napil Fellow, now Equal Justice Works. Wow. But they will. They still identify with Napil. It's really interesting. And there are even some board members who had that. <laughs> Didn't you say earlier though that originally before Napil it was Equal Justice Works Foundation? Well, Equal Justice Foundation. Oh, okay. It didn't so have you, works. I see. But when we changed the name back, I got a call from Ralph Nader saying, "Welcome home." You know, this is <laughs> you finally came back to the yeah, original yeah, idea. Good clue there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You finally woke up. So right. this is a better name. <laughs> wow. And so how did that feel? Was it like refreshing? Was it scary? Like you have this new brand. Did you make like a new mis mission statement? Did you change anything? So we had all sorts of things, Ryder. And it's, it's so funny think, looking back. In fact, uh, my wife just pulled off of the shelf, the top shelf of our house, a bottle of wine that we had created to celebrate the new naming that we were sending out. And it had the new logo. Um, and it had, it was like, the vineyards were the Napil vineyards. <laughs> 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 and it's not just a, um, it's not an organization, it's a mission. I mean, all these things that we did. And that was actually part of this for me, was I said, we will not ever refer to this organization, and I think you may know this about me, as EJW. Yeah. Because I had a very strong feeling that Napil, Napil didn't mean anything, it's another acronym, it's another thing, like all things in Washington, D.C., Equal Justice Works actually means something. It has a, a meaning that I thought people would really benefit um, from using that full name. So um, I never did EJW, despite staff um, and everyone else using EJW, um, staff and all of the outside people. But everyone in the organization knew that I was a stickler for using the spelling it all out. Well, I like that it's sort of an insider baseball thing where it's like, if you're in the know, you can say it. Yeah. And that means something to you. But externally, it makes sense to be all aligned. We're clear about equal justice works as our identity. You know, we don't put out just the acronym because who needs another, especially in D.C., right here with the al alphabet soup of agencies. Exactly. And EJW, what is that? If you've yeah. never heard of it before, you wouldn't know what it is. Yeah. But people also in these days don't like spelling out. Right. If they can find a shortcut, they like it, you know, LMO, you know, right. or <laughs> LMAO, you know, things like that. So people just want to have, you know, shortcuts. So it was a losing battle, but. I stuck with it for my 30 years. <laughs> yes. I mean, honestly, I think it's good advice for anyone starting a nonprofit is like, try not to make this the acronym, you know, just have a solid name that is really unique and recognizable. In fact, when I hear people use acronyms many times, my ear goes off right away and I'm like, what is that? And I know you know what that is, but I don't know. And I don't want to stop the conversation to have you identify and explain it all. But I am always thinking like, yeah, this was uh, important for me, and I'm glad we stuck to it. I'm glad I stuck to it. So um, as a, a lawyer, and I, I know you had some experience you know, 
working a little bit in private, a little bit federal. Now you're in nonprofit leadership. How much of that skill set as a lawyer was transferring over to your new job? That's a great question and one that I talk quite a bit with law students about because they often can't imagine what their future will look like. And I try to make sure that they know that going to law school does not mean a linear path to big law, a linear path to litigation, that there is a whole variety of ways in which you can contribute. I think we've all reached a consensus in this organization that being a lawyer, it being a justice-focused organization, was a really good attribute. I could talk the language. I had the experience. I knew what it was like to go to law school and feel an intense current pushing toward the private sector. Everything in the law school was structured toward feeding the big law firm hiring. It was, we're going to teach you courses on corporations and tax and decedents estates and property and all these things that really fit much more into the corporate world. Very few classes on public interest lawyering or civil rights or things like that. They were offerings, but just fewer. So, and all the career services offices geared towards supporting students going to big law. And here's how we're going to make it super easy for you to do it. You know, if you want to go do public interest work, good luck. Go out there and pound the pavement. But for if you wanted to go to, go to do a corporate job, we're going to create folders where you can drop your resume in and get interviews. And, do this. and I did that, actually, for one summer. I went to a private firm in Phoenix, Arizona, and it was a great experience. I loved the people that I worked with there. They had a shared commitment to a lot of the kind of values that I had in terms of pro bono work. They also worked for big companies like Apple. And, um, and I, at the end of that summer, the guy who was my mentor said, so one of the most important things is working with good people. And I think you've seen this summer the people that we have here, and we'd like you to be part of that team. And I was really drawn to that notion. But I also, and I told him, I said, I came with a clear purpose. I want to do public interest work. I told you that even when you hired me for the, for the summer. Um, and so that's where I'm going. Right. And so that, uh, like, early time, uh, when you were trying to figure out how to be a boss, but still connect with your kind of core product, essentially, of offering these fellowships, what were you like learning on the job uh, in terms of how you designed your new offerings, how you set the tone in the office, how you set the tone among your leaders and the you know their direct reports? So I'll give you an, an anecdote, but it's actually it's it's a transitional major transitional moment for the organization. So we had grown the fellowship program from seven fellowships, all funded from our the money that we got from those judges. And by the way, I should have mentioned this earlier, but once they saw the caliber of candidates that came through our application, everybody on that board said, we have struck gold. We're funding seven. We should be funding 100. This is ridiculous. There are so many talented people who our law firms would give their eye teeth if they would come and work for us, and they want to go do good in the world. If only people knew that, we would raise a lot of money. So they decided to pivot from a grant-making organization into a grant-seeking organization. And several board members said, well, that's not what I signed up for, but I'll help you find somebody who is the right person for this job. So we grew the fellowship room. We're actually, a guy who was absolutely fundamental to the growth of the organization. He was the founder of a law firm in Washington, D.C. called Kroll and & Mooring, and his name was Took Kroll. He's a character and a half. <laughs> Everybody who knows this guy talks about a charismatic leader. I mean, he, unconventional in every sense. Like, he would go in in his law firm. He'd go into an office while somebody's having a client call, and he'd turn the lights on and off in the office as people – and they're like, I'm on the phone with the client. He says, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> so crazy. He rode a bike in the law firm in the, uh, through the library. I mean, <laughs> just, <laughs> this guy was a character. But he was exactly the leader that we needed at this time of transition. Because he looked at the governance structure in particular, student-run organization, fellowships board separate, no one's clear who the boss is between these two entities, and he said, I got to clean this up. 
And I said, good luck. The students are never going to vote themselves out of power. And sure enough, he was that leader who got in front of those students and said, you're law students. You all know you're financially responsible for this organization. So, you know, I know you just came in for this meeting, but <laughs> you better, you know, get, get your, your wallet on the table. too." <laughs> and these students were like quick to say, yeah, we don't want to do that. We like the substance of the work. We don't really want to be involved in the governance of it. So again, lots of transition, which I won't bore you with, but lots of organizational change happening during this time. But Took got his law firm to be the first firm in the country to sponsor a fellowship. Mm. And then he said, David, you and I, we're gonna go around the country and we're gonna talk to all of my friends in big law firms and companies, and we're gonna get them to sponsor fellowship. It's hard work, and you're literally getting on the plane and going to different cities, but he really took me under his wing. I learned so much from Took. And we would go in, and these companies would say, okay, so I'll do one. So we grew it from seven to 14 fellowships. This was like the first couple of years. This was, it took three years from the launch of the fellowship program, maybe five years, actually, to get from seven to 14. Wow, okay, yeah. So it's hard work, yeah. and we're busting our bum, you know, just going out there and just trying to enlist people to do yeah. this. I told you that the person at the Ford Foundation thought we were her best grantee. So George Soros was just starting his philanthropy in the U.S. And the person he assigned to run the U.S. programs, a guy named Gara LaMarche, called the person at the Ford Foundation, Mary McClyman, and said, so I'm looking, and what do you think? And she said, well, this is the best organization that I, I support. you gotta, you got to look at this group. And he said, you know, he came, he said, he called me up and he said, I'm going to be in Washington, D.C. tomorrow. Do you have any time? And of course, I'm like, my calendar is clear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> George Soros, I've heard that name. <laughs> so he came down and we sat down and he said, well, Soros has this notion that lawyers have lost their moral compass. They're on their way to work every day. They step over homeless people. Mm. They don't really give back anymore. They're really focused on their profits and they, their public service is gone. And what can we do to instill that value? So he likes this idea of launching young lawyers who are going to go out there and have those values, and they're going to do it for two years, and then they're going to go to a firm, and they're going to bring those values with them. It was never this idea of, you know, they're going to make this their career. It was just give them a, an internship, basically, for two years, and that's going to help to change the profession. And let's get these law firms. They're sitting on the silence. What's going on? What can we do to incentivize them to get in the game? So he said, I'll match what you can raise. Hmm. And I said, well, like, how much? He said, well, yeah, whatever you can raise. I'm like, well, you, like, how much? And he says, sky's the limit. Well, and I'm sure, Ryder, in the same way that you said this earlier in this interview, he looked at a 35-year-old guy, tiny organization, crappiest office as you can imagine. <laughs> I mean, these things were horrible. Like the saw, you know, what are the, those things that hold up the tabletop? Saw horse. <laughs> saw horse, exactly. <laughs> Holding up the tabletop, I mean, just crappy everything. So this guy's thinking, how much can they raise? Look, it took them five years to grow from seven to 14. Like, what can they do? Well, we created a new model, and this was really, there's not alignment among the staff on this. I called it Root B, terrible name, <laughs> but Root B was basically, we know nonprofit organizations have ideas for these fellows. If they can bring in half of the money We'll get the other half from Soros, and then they can hire a person who will implement that idea, hire a new lawyer. We'll approve the lawyer in the end, but bottom line is give them an incentive to, to play in the game and help us raise this money. So we grew the program from 14 fellowships to 70 in one year. Wow. And we did not have the capacity to manage that. <laughs> but we grew quickly, really quickly. But there was a staff member who said, you are selling out because this, the model that we had created was so perfect. And by creating this other avenue where we're getting loss, you know, nonprofit organizations coming up with projects, it just doesn't have that same chemistry of the individual dreaming up the project. It's a project that needs to be done. They're finding a person who can do it. That's not the same thing as the entrepreneur presenting their project to us. So I said, get over it. We have to have multiple streams. Let's, this is an opportunity. We can grow this program much faster if we have the help of many others than if we try to do this ourselves. We've seen what it takes for us to do it. Seven to 14, five years. 
But if we can incentivize others to help us, it grows. So we did that, and Route B was you know, very successful. We got a lot of nonprofits lining up to raise money, and, and they did, and we got the matching money from Soros. Soros that year said, $3 million, that's the sky. <laughs> that's the limit. We won't match more than that. And then we went and we saw, after a few years, we'd go to these firms that were doing the Route B matching, and they go, who are you? What's a fellowship? We just gave it because the organization told us that we could get matching money from Soros if we gave them this money. So there was no identity between the firm and the fellow. They did not even know that they were doing a, sponsoring a fellowship. And the renewal rates were 18%, whereas the renewal rates on the traditional approach where the person would come up with the project was 85 90%. So we said we've got to wean everybody off of this. Man. The source money is here today, gone tomorrow. We've got to go to the one that's going to give us the longest staying power with high renewal rates. So we moved all those sponsors from the Route B into Route A. It took some time, and Soros, meanwhile, was cutting back his funding every year with a predictable decline. Um, and at the end, we sustained the program at the much larger number because of our very deliberate moving people to this other model that was higher satisfaction, higher renewal rates. So you kept engaging with nonprofits on one level, but then you added back going to law firms directly to get them to sponsor individual fellowships? Yes. So we went to all those ones that did the matching model, mm -hmm. and we said, so you did it this way, the first go-round. We want to tell you about this other model that we have where we have very high satisfaction among our other donors. They're all renewing at 90%. You ought to be doing this. We also changed our board dramatically in order to get more people who had those connections that took had with big law firms. So this was a very interesting, and again, I hate to go into too many details, so tell me if to stop if, if I am. But um, we had 13 students on the board and 10, maybe 12 others, including federal judges, public interest people, and a half dozen, maybe even less, law firm leaders and general counsel. So the law firm leader pulled in a lot of the students into a group called an ad hoc committee on board effectiveness. So we just passed a strategic plan. We have big ambitions for the organization. And the question is, is this board that we've got with 13 students and only a handful of people like me who can help raise the money, is this a board that can get that strategic plan accomplished? And everybody shook their heads and said, no. And so he says, so what board do we need? And people were volunteering to step aside in order to create a board that could really fulfill the strategic mission of the organization. And it changed the composition of the board dramatically. The number of students dropped from 13 to 6 and then 3. We added many more people from the private sector who were in a position to help us grow the program and sustain it. We had Route B and Route A, you know, and then we just moved everything over to Route A, and we got many more of those, um, many more of those companies by virtue of board members who had connections there to start sponsoring these fellowships. And one of my lines, Ryder, which I still rely on heavily, is something I call strategic luck, which is being in a position where luck can happen to you. So with the Ford Foundation money, you know, we got that money, we did a great job, we did not facilitate the conversation between the Ford Foundation person and the Soros person. That happened. That was luck. But we positioned ourselves by having a great program and doing phenomenal work that was getting the attention of this person, the Ford Foundation, to get that referral. That's strategic luck. In our board development, we had the director of litigation at Pfizer who was on our board, and then he became the general counsel. That is a position that is the top legal position in a company. General counsel give out money to big law firms in, in doing the work of the company. And so that general counsel has a lot of power and authority in the legal profession. Once we had one general counsel, we said, we're not going down to mm. the director of litigation anymore. We're holding the line at general counsel because if another general counsel sees a director of litigation, it's not important enough for me you just go and get an another, another director of litigation, or you can have mine, but I'm not going to do it. By holding the line, we then attracted many more general counsel, and that elevated the board dramatically. 
in addition to adding more managing partners of law firms who wanted to have a seat on a board with other general counsel. And again, many people have wanted to replicate this model. It is true that as a national nonprofit, we had an advantage over local nonprofits on that model, but it really was, we put together the dream team of board members who could reach out to their law firms and get them to sponsor fellowships. And my point on this is, Root B was in an innovation, and it turned out it was the bump that we needed to get to a certain level. And then we morphed that to what works best, kind of returned to our roots in many ways, but kept the program at a much larger size than we could ever have done if we did it gradually, bit by bit. So taking advantage of opportunities when they present themselves and creating different models. So one other example of that is in 2008, there was a big crisis and law firms were losing money and everybody was freaking out, yeah. charitable giving down, everybody was... And we said, well, what if companies and law firms, none of them wanted to pay full freight for fellowship anymore? So we were afraid we were going to have a dramatic loss in fellowships. And we proposed law firms and companies teaming up together and sharing the cost of a fellowship. And that was a bumper product. <laughs> I mean, everybody wanted that one. <laughs> We've been doing it on our own, but now that we're seeing that model over there, <laughs> can we can we get a sign up with that one? So that one also allowed for a lot of growth. And people looked around and said, you know, genius, brilliant. I want to ask you a question. So for the board, is it typical for a nonprofit like that to have students on the board? No, rare. In fact, so our board is really unique in that we had law students, federal judges, public interest leaders, um, managing partners of law firms, general counsel of companies. I mean, that composition. And they're sharing the same table, the same voting power. Exactly. Wow. And the thing that was beautiful about it was the exchange. Yeah of people who literally were facing these issues firsthand, educational debt, lack of a public interest job, being diehard committed, having a conversation with the general counsel of a big bank, who really does not have that experience, doesn't know what that looks like or feels like. But hearing that testimonial really does change that person's mind. And I could see it every time in strategic planning, some of the insights that the students would bring to the table would change the thinking of people who were in the private sector who just didn't have that experience. They didn't know that that's what it looked like. Any notable memories from a board meeting that you just were like, wow, this is working exactly how I envisioned it or? Yes, in fact, I it was one that both affected me but it affected the whole board. So there was a student who said, so schools that have a lot of resources behind them, all of those students are getting one-on-one -on -one counseling about how to put together a winning application for a fellowship. But schools that are less resourced, where their really focus is just get them any job, they don't have somebody who's devoted to helping them on fellowship applications. And those students, especially first-generation students, they don't know how to do this. They don't know the power of relationships and connections and getting somebody to review their application before they submit it, having moot courts before their interview, all of these things. So the students kept on saying, you have to be thinking about those students that don't have any resources in their school and also are first-generation law students who just do, they don't have, they don't know how the game is played. And as a result, we had a much more of an emphasis in all of our materials about trying to level the playing field so that no matter where you went to law school, you would know basically the techniques that other people are using in order to land these fellowships. It is the thing I'm incredibly proud of, um, is that the organization was never really elitist. We, you know, there's another fellowship program, the Skadden Fellowship Program, and they have 80% of their fellows, almost 100% of their fellows, come from eight law schools, the top eight law schools. And they, uh, most of them have top grades. That's their selection criteria. And they have funded some unbelievable leaders. So I don't want to detract on that, but that's just not our selection criteria. We look at people who come from the community, who have work, real world experiences that make it likely that they're gonna be successful rather than grades or which law school they went to. And we also had a real commitment to diversity. So we had 35, 40% of our fellows were people of color, lots of students who were transgender or LGBTQ. And it just, to me, it was a, it was a better program in that sense of having kind of more diversity of fellows 
than other programs. And the reason why this is so significant is that we did not do the picking. We got law firms and companies to do the picking. Now, they have their prejudices, just like Skadden. They're going to take the top of the class. And yet, by us screening and helping and coaching and presenting candidates that they would never have seen if they only looked at the resume, but us steering them to look at some of these candidates, they fell in love. They were like, oh, my God, this is the perfect person to do this project. They're from the community. They have instant credibility. They've done this work before. They've spent their whole law school time building for this moment. And that won the day over the person with the highest academic accomplishments. And I just, I was so proud of the fact that we put our values in that area and really got these big private sector entities to be picking people who, if you had written the script, you would mm -hmm. never think that they would pick these candidates. And yet it's been the winning formula. So that's interesting. So you're talking about the selection process of a fellow. Yes. Right. And so um, going back to that a little bit, because I think it took me actually a little while to wrap my mind around it. You're sort of like a nonprofit's nonprofit in a way where that you're placing people at organizations who then benefit from it. So in a sense, you're, a lar you're working at this national level to disseminate, to bring all this talent to other partner organizations, essentially. Yeah, we're right? in a way, and yeah. this is how I kind of describe it, in a way we're a broker. Right. We have the candidates, all these law students on the one hand who are in law schools all around the country who want to do public interest work. We find law firms and companies that are interested in supporting the best talent in their communities or on issues that they care about. And we put them together. We take those students who have these great ideas and connect them to the law firms and companies and say, you know, have at it. And the thing that I, again, I've been involved with so many of the interviews, and it is one of the most joyful experiences, is to see the eureka feeling among those sponsors to say, like, who knew that there was this much talent? It's the same thing I had with the board when we did our first competition. They were like, I had no idea that there were so many compelling people who have this passion to go and do good work in our community. And it's a privilege to be able to support them. How do we choose? You know, we'd like to fund more than one, which, of course, we'd always say, please do. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I just love the idea that you're putting these uh, fellows directly in front. So the decision-making process of where their funding goes to is predicated on the exact project that they've developed. And so they're feeling a lot of ownership or uh, responsibility and, and c contribution to exactly where their resources are going. Yes. So it's not like they're writing a check and then you say, we've done this this year. They've seen the face and the individual. And Ryder, in my opinion, that is the winning formula. I do not believe people would, law, big law firms would put it into a communal po uh, pool of money that then we would give out. Their identity with the fellow, that personal connection, the level of enthusiasm, I say this when we would go and talk to potential sponsors, the level of excitement by involving members of your team about where some of the charitable money is going to go and picking the person is just an extraordinary experience. We actually did it for our staff one year where we raised enough money to be able to fund an extra fellowship and our staff got to participate in the selection process. And they too had the same experience of like, wow, you meet these incredible candidates and you fall in love. You want them, you want them to be selected. And again, to talk in uh, private sector terms, like what better marketing could you have done? I mean, than c creating that personalized experience for the person who's you know, potentially gonna donate. So you're giving them that like, you know, direct connection to it. Exactly. So how did you operationalize and scale that? Because it's it sounds very intensive what you're talking about, like the amount of meetings, the amount of courting, the amount of, you know, screening. That's like a huge program. And that is the challenge with our model. It is high touch relationships with our sponsors. And that makes us unique in many respects. We're asking for a very large contribution. This, for a lot of law firms and companies, is their largest single contribution that they make to an organization. So it requires that level of caretaking and attention and retail services to make them have that kind of eureka experience. 
But the numbers really speak for themselves, the number of renewals and the number of people who come back for more. It's proof that it works. Now, if you disrupt it and you say, oh, well, we want to cut a corner here, we want to cut a corner there, you know, it, there was a lot of conversation among our staff about how intensive, labor intensive it is to do it and were there ways of cutting back a bit, especially when the staff is at full sprint to make sure all these connections and relationships happen during the selection process. People are exhausted. They're so tired. Can we do it? Is there a more efficient way of doing this? And my answer to that is always, listen, everybody looks at the model the way it is, including me, and, they, and you can think a rhyme or reason why it looks the way it does. But if there's anything we've learned about this organization over time, it's that we made these decisions without really any experience. We kind of made the best judgment we could at the time, and then we adjusted and morphed and created different models. You know, I've told you a couple of them, but that idea of like, it's, it's in stone. We do it and they have to do it this way and there's no other way of doing it. That's just, that is a formula for an organization to either stay flat or decline. You have to always be entrepreneurial and thinking about, is there a different model, a different way? So there were lots of discussions about, could we change this? Is there a way of pooling either in a region or doing something different from the way we do it now? And I think that's healthy. That's a good thing. So you've got private sector, you've got some government stuff. This yeah. is all creating your portfolio of sustaining you year over year. And at some point you introduced the gala or yeah. later to be called the scales of justice. <laughs> did that, wh how did you come up with this idea? And then how did that fit into your portfolio of where the funds were coming from? So uh, of course this is one of my favorite stories because <laughs> it is so unimaginable with hindsight that we could actually pull this off. We, when I started with the organization, the dinner was at a Chinese restaurant, and we'd raised not a single dollar from a law firm. We had actually one lawyer from a law firm that was there because he was friends with the honoree that year. But otherwise, it was all a bunch of law students who were getting awards for doing great summer public interest work. And everybody would come in, and they paid their 20 bucks to get some wonton soup and some <laughs> spare ribs. <laughs> and we had a great time. It was, again, but it was in a Chinese restaurant. It was totally informal, hardly a stage hardly a stage. And then I suggested to Kathleen, maybe we should do the dinner circuit. You see all these other organizations and they do it and they raise all this money. And we did it the first year. We honored Peter Edelman and Marion Wright Edelman, two public interest giants in the Washington DC community. Marion ran the Children's Defense Fund. Peter was a long time Bobby Kennedy top lieutenant, became a professor of law, but has done so much on juvenile justice. I mean, a real public interest hero. So we decided we're gonna honor these two people at a dinner. And we busted our butts. Nobody wanted to give us any money. We'd raised money at $1,000 a pop. $2,500 might've been the top donation that year. And at the end of it, you know, we had a dinner, probably 150 people, we raised $70,000, barely enough to cover the cost of that dinner, certainly not enough to cover the cost that we spent in raising the money. And Kathleen Welch turned to me and said, remind me never to do that again. And I have always told this story because I saw potential. She saw a total sinkhole. <laughs> but I saw potential to grow that. The people had such a good time at that dinner. They were so inspired by these law students doing good work, they saw, you know, they met other people who were in the program and they started spreading the word. It's a way in which I've always talked about this, the power of networking and relationships. So that group of, you know, 150, next year turned into 250 and turned into 500. And each time it's growing with word of mouth and people saying, oh, this is an organization worth supporting. I went to their dinner. I was really inspired by their dinner. And then we also started trying to raise more money and it slowly graduated 70,000, dollars two fifty, And I will tell you, I had other friends in the nonprofit community. And when we were starting to get close to a million dollars, I mean, that was the nugget that if we could raise a million dollars at one night for, oh my God, we will have, you know, hit the jackpot. And each year we're getting closer and closer and closer. And so one year I remember telling the honoree, our goal is a million dollars. He was like, you'll never hit a million dollars. <laughs> Not around me, <laughs> you know? And sure enough, when we broke that, the, that glass ceiling, I mean, it really did feel like we could never do it. It was 
such a magic moment. And I thought we would never see more than a million dollars. And then, of course, we kept on growing it. And somebody had told me this. Another nonprofit fundraising person said, every time you think you've hit the threshold, you keep on aiming higher. And surprisingly, you get higher, and that's your new floor. So each time that we did this and we hit a higher number, that became our new floor. And so the numbers kept on going up. Finally, we had a 25th anniversary event, and we said, okay, so why don't we do a goal of $2 million, unheard of, and anything we raise over $2 million, we'll put to the future, an innovation fund. It's always hard to start a new initiative with the money that you get that's supporting this year's operations. If you can get some money that you can actually put forward to launching new initiatives, once you prove them, people will support them because they're successful and people have seen that they actually work. So we raised, I think we had a goal of maybe $2.3 million, and I think we raised maybe 2.7 or something higher than we ever imagined. Um, and that was really the beginning of something new because part of our strategy for that year was not to have an honoree, to celebrate the organization and to assemble a steering committee. Instead of asking one honoree to reach out to their law firms, we assembled a steering committee of 15 general counsel of companies that would approach their law firms to support, uh, support us. And that generated a much higher number. And once we saw the power of a team on a host committee of general counsel, we stuck with that. And then we hit $3 million. And I, to this day, <laughs> I still can't believe it because we had six years in a row of hitting $3 million at the dinner. And I just never thought it would be possible. So what time frame is this? We're talking about early 2000s? No, this is more recent than that. Okay. I'd say it's probably two. Th okay, so we were founded in 1986. The 25th anniversary would have been 2000. Uh, was that right? No, 20. 2011. Okay, got it. 2011, I think, yeah. was our 25th. And then. You're really hitting your stride there. Yeah, and I'd say 2015 or 16 is where we just started to really hit that $3 million mark. And we were in that 2.7 to 3 million for several years in that period. And that's all based on uh, essentially getting firm law firms or others to buy full tables? Yes. And yeah. the difference between a general counsel, and again, I'm just being very pragmatic about it, mm -hmm. general counsel would reach out to their law firms to ask for support. They have very, a lot of reluctance to do this because they're negotiating with these firms for good deals. Yeah. But they also know the firms have money set aside to support organizations their clients care about. So all they're doing is saying, so this is one that I care about. Can you release some of that money to support this organization? And then when you get five general counsel reaching out to a single firm saying this is an organization I care about, it makes it much easier for the law firm to say, yeah, we're going to make a larger than normal contribution to this organization. Yeah. So we started to get contributions that, again, were unthinkable in that first year when we did the Marion uh, Peter dinner. Uh, we started to get $25,000 contributions, $50,000 contributions. It was mm. just amazing. And, that's, and, and then we'd also have attendance, and it wasn't the typical dinner in Washington, D.C. Most people send their associates to the dinner. The firm will buy a table, but they send kind of people who will appreciate the work but are not the decision makers about the dollars. At our dinner, because the general counsel were attending, the relationship partner to that company would have to attend. They would fly in from all over the country to attend this dinner because they knew their client was there and their client had asked them to support the dinner and they wanted the client to see, not only did we do it, I did it. I did it for you. And as a result, we would get the power brokers who were coming in. That room, everyone would say, I've never seen a room quite like this because it was almost like an association. Everybody wanted to talk to everybody else. It was not one of these things where we're here just for the dinner program. We like the networking time. We like seeing all of the people who are assembled in one room from all over the country. And united for a good cause. Exactly. It feels good about being there. So, and Ryder, you've been to the dinner, so you know the feeling people have when they leave that dinner. They are proud to be a lawyer. They're proud to support an organization. They're inspired by this next generation of lawyers. You see them, they, they got a kick in their step as they're walking out. They're like, 
this is the best thing I have done. It reminds me of why I went to law school in the first place. And the idea that I'm supporting a young lawyer who's going to go and do this work just fills their heart, makes them feel so good. So after the dinner, you go and visit with people, and they were just so enthusiastic about it. God, that fellow was working in Tennessee, changed the whole healthcare landscape. I know, what a great story. And of course, you helped bring a lot of those stories to the dinner, which again, inspired a lot of people to get involved with the organization. So yeah, tell me about uh, now that you've got this audience, you have created enough interest that you're gonna get people to show up in person, and now it's on you to create that feeling that you just described of how are they gonna feel after I have their undivided attention for an hour and a half. So how did you approach that? What did you decide was the most important thing to do with that audience in your hand? This evolved dramatically over the years. So initially, we had law student award winners, we had law school dean award winners, we had somebody from corporate general counsel, and we just had a whole lineup. And it was one honoree after another. And at some point, and I know this is still a bit controversial even now in the organization, we decided, no, let's not focus on other people, let's focus on us. Let's focus on our story. Let's not tell about the student who spent a summer working in a legal aid program in Washington State. Let's talk about one of our fellows and the impact that they've had. So we turned it, we, and you also have to know, the fatigue that people feel in these fundraising dinners, you have to let them out by nine o'clock. And there are way too many dinners that don't have that discipline and that go way over nine o'clock and people are looking at their watch, a lot of people exiting, they'll never come back to that dinner again after having had that long speech. And I've been to a lot of those dinners. <laughs> so we just said we have to be focused. We're gonna have to get rid of some of the things. We like those things, but we have to get rid of them in order to tell a different story, in order to really inspire and motivate our audience. So that was a pretty significant change in the structure of it. There are definitely still law school deans who are pissed that we don't have a law school dean of the year award. There's still students who wish that we had that. I think the organization has looked at we ought to honor an, uh, an alum every year to celebrate again. That t is part of our product, and so I th I'm all in favor of it, but it's just an evolution. We have to keep on changing to make sure that that program is relevant, inspiring, and people walk out with that skip in their step. So I think by really focusing and being, and again, as, as an executive director, I don't think there's anybody who spent more time in the weeds around this event than me. And people criticized me for getting in the weeds on this, but I felt like this is our most important marketing moment of the year. And I wanna know every word is carefully thought through, the messaging, what we profile, what are people's reactions gonna be, try our best to anticipate that. We had a few instances where people walked out saying, I hate that issue. I don't like this organization because they're supporting, transgender rights could have been one of the ones, but something where and I was really mindful of, on the one hand, we wanna promote and highlight fellows that are doing great work. And on the other hand, we have to be thoughtful about our audience and what messages are gonna resonate most with them and finding that balance. So I think sometimes we would do a transgender rights and then we would do a veterans rights so that we'd be able to appeal to different parts of our audience to find something in the dinner that they were like, oh, love that, love that. And that happened. I can't tell you how many times I would talk to somebody after the dinner and they'd say, that one was not so impressed, but that other one knocked my socks off. And it would change. They'd have different perceptions as to which one knocked their socks off. So again, I think we did a really good, strategic, thoughtful job over time of really crafting a program that we knew was gonna generate that level of enthusiasm among our, among our, our attendees. I started ca calling it uh, law prom at some <laughs> point. I forget when, I don't know if anyone else has ever coined that phrase. No, that's, that's the what, first. That's what I just always saw, you know, when we were coming down. And it was also, uh, you know, a very special moment for me as a young filmmaker. You know, we met in, I believe it was 2012, um, for the films that we were making. And, and of course they were beautiful stories too, but to see them on the big screen with this big audience. I remember the first one I went to, I couldn't believe the scale of it because I just had no context. And it was just this moment of awe of like, my goodness, 
if I made a film for anyone else, I'd be lucky if my parents watched it. <laughs> but this is like the big deal for me. It's like a film premiere. And I'll just never forget, you know, that that moment. Um, but I, I did want to uh, talk about. Well, Ryder, before yeah. you leave that, because that's a really good point. First of all, I don't think I knew the scale of the dinner until I actually saw. I'd, I'd get very nervous once I'd walk in and see how many tables there were. It's, it's a big deal. A thousand people is a really big event. And I don't think I appreciate it until I saw it. <laughs> And then, of course, the challenge of you want everybody to, and this is, again, my personal strategy, you want everybody to feel like they're part of this, right? That their support, their law firm gave a contribution. How can they feel an individual connection? And we started that text to give program where we asked individuals, we said, we know your law firm gave money, but if you're inspired by what you're seeing tonight, you can text in a contribution, and if we raise enough money, we've got somebody who's going to match it, but if we raise enough money, we're going to be able to sponsor another fellow next year, like the one you just saw. And that inspired people to reach into their own personal pockets. And it's not for general support. It's for something very discreet, something that they say, with my support, another lawyer is going to go and do good. It's not more money for Equal Justice Works. It's money for a very specific cause. And that has taken off as well and done something that I think people have both an excitement as they see the scale go up, <laughs> you know, the thermometer goes up. And when they finally see it hit the number, they're just everyone's celebrating. It's another moment of kind of community collective action that makes people give each other high fives and walk out of that dinner with a spring in their step. I help make that happen. And I think it was perhaps the most brilliant innovation that I've ever seen um, particularly having seen, I think maybe the first year there wasn't a text to give fellow because the technology wasn't quite there yet. But for me, seeing that you would show a film and then immediately afterwards open up a text to give, I mean, that's the closest you can get to an ROI on your investment in filmmaking and marketing. Exactly. You know, because this is their most recent action they can take after watching something and being very emotional at that yes. moment because again i think those films were if anything and you i think you've seen me actually screening them where i cry during them they're so powerful so emotional people want to support that work and you know take to give them an outlet to do that right then and there is really powerful it's awesome. Yeah, it's it's been a real highlight for me, absolutely. And I, I did want to talk also about your kind of personal brand um, because I think, you know, particularly for this rather buttoned-up crowd yeah. of, uh, you know, D.C. lawyers and, and other corporate counsel and whatnot, uh, you presented um, as such a, a ball of energy and were known for your happy dance of all things on stage. And it was something that clearly really resonated with that audience. Like everyone talked about it. They're like, oh my God, David is just, he just gets me so excited. And I, I was kind of not expecting that, you know, for this kind of crowd. Why do you think that worked? It, it is so funny because when I first did it, because I was so excited that we hit $3 million at the dinner. And that was, I think the first time that I did the happy dance. And, um, and the person who was watching me do my rehearsal laughed hysterically. And I was like, okay, so I'm making a fool of myself. Everybody's gonna laugh and think this is crazy, but it's how I feel. I just feel a euphoria and excitement and enthusiasm, and I'm gonna let it out. I'm gonna show them. <laughs> and, and to my surprise, everybody started talking about, so are you gonna do the happy dance? Will you do? And I was like, oh my God, it was only a one-time thing, but I realized that it really was something that people wanted and they wanted me to do it time and time again. So I did, it became a signature. But it really was spontaneous that one year, because $3 million, <laughs> who knew? I was so ecstatic about it, and then it really turned into something that was an annual event. Amazing. And then my favorite story is actually when we had the virtual dinner. Yeah. I did the rehearsal, and Sarah Lackritz, I said, so how was the happy dance? And she said, eh, eh. I was like, what, what do you mean, eh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not an amp person. Somebody says, ah, oh, she's a B. A B? <laughs> I'm not a B. I'm going for the A. So, of course, it is hysterical. And there's a meme of it, of me doing the craziest happy dance of my life <laughs> <laughs> at that dinner. And if, and we all laugh at it. It's, yeah. it's hysterical, including me. Yeah. <laughs> I laugh at it. Yeah, no, I, I created that meme. I'm I know you did. 
<laughs> with lots of fist pumps yes. and crazy and three stooges yeah. sounds and <laughs> it's awesome. And it's it just also just an incredible accomplishment that you kept the momentum going through the two years of the pandemic where we could not have the in dinner person. Yeah. in person. Um, but uh, that that you know is just a testament to how committed people were, even if they didn't get to go and they still saw the value in you know the work you're doing. And I, uh, so that one, I actually, I did find that hard, really hard, because I do think that the personal connection is 90% of this, and when it's remote, it's just much harder for people to have that same experience. Um, I was really happy that people tuned in um, both years. Different audience. First year, it was the big shots. Second year, associates. And I saw that as a really dramatic difference. People just, they were fatigued. They didn't want to take time to watch a movie or a tv show of equal justice works at the end of the night it's like nah right even though we we upped the production value like a hundredfold exactly but it didn't matter it didn't matter yeah it didn't matter and i i think i learned a lesson on that one which is there's really no substitute for the in-person people having that tactile experience people having that emotional thing you can't force them to do it especially when it's at night at home and the fact that people make an effort, it's a really intentional decision to go to a dinner. You really have to, you have to be invested in it to yeah. make that time commitment. Yeah. And it really does. It, it's incredible what effect it has on people. Well, that pretty much brings us up to today. Yeah. And congratulations on your retirement after 30 years. That's incredible. Um, I'd love to hear about that transition. But more importantly, uh, what are you doing now? Yeah. So let me tell you two things. First of all. Uh, and Sarah Lackritz and I, we had a big debate about retirement versus stepping down. So I definitely, 30 years was enough, and I knew it was time for me to step down. And I also had said to the board for many years leading up to it, like, I am absolutely open to stopping any time, especially if you think I'm not as effective as I once was or not as creative or innovative or not bringing to the table what needs to happen. So tell me. And I realized that was never going to happen. The board was going to keep on saying, oh, no, you're doing great. Keep it going. Da, da, da. So I said, I have to be the one to initiate this. It's not going to come from the board. So I also planned it way in advance and wanted to make sure the organization was at its top form when I left. I wanted to juice it up as much as I could in order to hand over to a new executive director. Here's an organization that has got lots of wind in its sails. And you can take it in a lot of new directions and do different things, but not inherit a mess. And that is, I think, what happens to a lot of organizations when there's transition is that, you know, something's wrong with the organization and you're stuck trying to plug holes rather than really thinking about what it could be. So I felt really good about how I left the organization. We had a big federal grant coming in. We raised an extra million dollars that was on top of our annual budget that was kind of a retirement fund to give to the new person. So I feel really good about that. I also was very deliberate about not sticking around. I wanted to be super clear that I was gone. There's a new leader there. I decided not to attend the dinner that year because I wanted the spotlight entirely on the new leader. And I literally, the day I stopped, I went off to um, a remote cabin in the Shenandoah Valley with my dog and my bike. And we had a week together just decompressing. And it was like a physical embodiment of a change, which was great. And then I had all sorts of adventures lined up of a bike trip, in Utah that I had wanted to do since 2010. There was an article in the New York Times Magazine and had a full page spread of the Red Rock Canyons. And I was like, I am doing this bike ride. Well, it took, I couldn't do it when I was working because all vacations are spent with family. But here's a chance for me now to have, and my wife is continuing to work. So I had freedom to be able to plan trips that I wanted to do. And I also made a commitment not to say yes to anything. There were a lot of people who called me and said, would you join our board? Would you consider working on this project, that project? And I said no to everything. But the best advice somebody gave me was make sure you write down those names of the people who called you because in one year they're not going to call you (laughs) and you're not going to remember who called you. And each is true. Now I don't hear from anybody. I see people once in a while, but really, I'm not getting any calls. And... It's not like I would have remembered any of those names had I 
not written them down. So that was good advice that somebody gave me. But in the last year, I've gone on four ski trips, three bike trips, a trip with my daughter and her fiance, which happened, by the way, on the first day of retirement. They got engaged. Oh. It's fantastic. Uh, to Rwanda and Tanzania. Then I went solo to Vietnam, Cambodia, Cambodia Morocco, Turkey, um, trip to Honduras, Mexico. So I've just had just a ton of adventures. I just had a bike trip in, in Utah, another bike trip. Just had tons of adventures. I like a lot of physical activity. It's allowed me to turn my focus away from the grind. Um, I am so grateful for these tours where I have to make no decisions at all. Somebody tells me, here's what we're doing today. Just show up at 7.30 in the morning and we got gotcha you for the day. You know, <laughs> <laughs> the activities are lined up. That's like a dream come true. It's allowed me to operate in a totally different place than when I was literally making decisions all day, which yeah. is exhausting. And yeah. and it's all scheduled. Everything is scheduled. And, and the idea of going on a place where you're having these amazing experiences and seeing parts of the world I'd never seen before, and the company that I've chosen to go with, Intrepid Travel, they have a real commitment to the communities where we travel. They're relatively inexpensive. I'm a three-star guy. I don't need anything <laughs> high-end. Um, but they, ha they put you into communities where you go and you stay in people's homes and you go and visit them for tea or coffee and have conversations. So there's a real cultural immersion. They also use their ta travel dollars, you know, because it's a lot of money that they aggregate to supporting women's co-ops and other businesses that, you know, the tourist industry doesn't really support those. Mm -hmm. They support a lot of the entrenched companies. So I like a, a lot of features of this and they're relatively inexpensive. So all those features together have been like a winning formula for me. When you're on those long bike rides or you know, train in Vietnam or whatever it is, do you find your mind floating back to what you were working on before you retired? No. Um, and in fact, I would say probably, and one of the things I was a little nervous about on this conversation was, am I going to remember all the things that happened during my time there because I don't spend time thinking about it. So those memories feel like they're they're fragile, they could go away. But obviously I lived them, so many of them are still there. If you ask me about names, which again, <laughs> I prided myself in remembering a ton of names, I'd struggle a bit. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm happy that we're not doing that. <laughs> but That's amazing that you've really been able to turn off because I know when I'm on vacation, it's maybe because I'm still in the middle of it, I'm 35 now, that I could never, you know, after day three, I'm like thinking about next Ryder, week. I did the same, and I always did. When I was on vacation, first of all, I had a policy of, and people hated this, I'd answer emails. <laughs> I never turned my out of office yeah, on. I, I don't either. <laughs> because, first of all, yeah. I, I hated the idea of coming back from vacation and being hit with a 1,000 emails. I just did not want to do that. That was horrible reentry for me. And second, I could figure out how to budget this in there where it was not interfering with vacation. I could do it in early morning or late night, just get it off my plate and have those things going on and also have a little sense about what was going on in the organization while I was away. Mm -hmm. It was really was, for me, healthy. I never felt like it was a burden. I never felt it was bad. But I was 24-7 Equal Justice Works. I lived that mission. I lived that organization. I wanted, I was so ambitious for it. I always wanted the next new thing. So it was it felt com comfortable and really natural. And, and because it, of the shape you left it in, you felt like it was okay. Exactly. Well, the thing, and I really want to emphasize this because it was a really hard decision. When I said I wanted to leave, my wife was like, no, this is ridiculous. You are, this is what you do. You live this organization. You come home from work. You put the kids to bed. Again, when we had kids at home, now they're all off in the world. And then you sit down with a smile on your face and you're cranking out emails. <laughs> it's like, you can't give that up. You have this annual dinner where people adore you and you have this adulation. Like, how are you going to live without that? And I was like, I don't think it's going to be a problem. I really don't think I ever put my ego – listen, I have an ego. But I don't think I put my ego ahead of the organization. I believe in the mission. I believe in what this organization does. I believe in the products, if you want to call them that, the work that we do. I believe so wholeheartedly, and I felt so confident that that would continue without me. 
And I felt like we built such a great team and a strong staff that it was all sustainable and potential for the next bump, the next innovation. So I felt like it was the right time for a whole bunch of reasons. And the pandemic definitely triggered a few things that made me go like, it's time. Mm -hmm. I think people are tired of me <laughs> and my approach because I'm nostalgic about those early days when there was a lot of innovation happening and a lot of speed, and I thrive on that. So I'm always asking for more and more and more. And I think people were tired. Like, David, you're always asking right. for more. Right. So I kind of had, I got the signals, and I also kind of felt it myself that it was time. But the thing that I have spent time, and I really want to spend some time now thinking about this, is how do you leave an organization that you've helped to build that you're so passionate about, you feel like you're still in your prime and able to contribute a lot, how do you leave that? And I really did make a very deliberate choice to pivot 180 degrees so I was not looking in my rear view mirror at all and retired into things that I was very excited about. And I admit this year has been entirely selfish. I have not done anything for anyone else <laughs> other than for me. and. I have loved it, and I've not felt guilty about it. I, I do think that, as I said, the reason why I have an issue with the retirement word is, okay, is that the end for David Stern? Are you finished? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. I think that there's probably more for me to do, more for me to contribute. I care so passionately about so many issues that I promised my wife and I promised everybody, I promised myself, that after a year of all this adventure, that I would have conversations with people and see what's out there and see whether there's a place that I could I could contribute. You, you know? finally got your gap year. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Which I had, Three by the way. decades later. Yeah, I had wanted to do this. This was actually a really <laughs> good point that you're making. So we had in instituted a sabbatical program 20 years ago in the organization. I could never take it because I always felt like there was something important that was on the horizon board meeting, another thing, all these things that would always consume me. It was never a good time for a sabbatical. So five years ago, I took that sabbatical, and I was gone from the organization for three months, no emails, no communications. My number two, Sarah Morello, was in charge, and we did not miss a beat. And that really was so op eye-opening for me. Like, I can leave this organization. It runs beautifully without me. And... I can really disconnect. And I enjoyed that time that I had. I had also mm -hmm. filled it with adventures. And so I said, okay, I can see this. And so the year, this year has really been an extension of that three month sabbatical of like, I had an appetite after that for more of it. So one year now I've been able to do that same kind of intense travel and adventures. Um, and now I'm I, in the new year in 2024, I will consider kind of what the next gig might be. Really? Okay. I don't want to I don't want to run an organization anymore. Yeah. But I also think and I've had some conversations with the current executive directors where I've been able to help them map out really short conversations. I haven't been involved in the implementation of it, but I've been able to map out here's what it could look like. If you want to follow kind of this roadmap yeah. of I want to change the composition of my board or I want to do strategic planning differently than we've done it in the past. Those are all things that I've done, right. and I have some great models and templates, and they're not automatically replicable, but perhaps we can kind of talk through and figure out how do you implement some of these things if you want them in your organization. Absolutely, and, and two things that stuck out to me. One is that this idea that um, you knew it was time to leave as a, you know, I know you weren't technically the founder, but as, as basically the original executive director, leader of Equal Justice Works, um, that it was time to take it from that like startup mentality of leadership to like now we're a really established firm and it maybe requires a slightly different cadence or style of leadership for the next 25 years or 30 100%. years. 100%. And I also think, and this is something that was always on my mind, is as a 63 then, now I'm 64, 63-year-old leader, actually I was 64 when I sat down, so 64-year-old white male leader of an organization that's about the next generation of lawyers who are all young, ambitious, and you know, I think I brought the energy, but that is a disconnect between me and what the organization's values are, and I just felt like, God, it's time for 
new leadership, and the new person, phenomenal in her own right. She was worked at the National Women's Law Center, was the dean of University of Cincinnati Law School, and she brings in different perspectives, different experiences that I think really benefit the organization. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the other point I wanted to highlight is uh, your note about the sabbatical as probably being a really healthy thing for particularly any nonprofit leaders slash founders for them to create that experience of disconnecting. 100%. And I regret that I was not able to figure out how to make it happen earlier in my tenure. I, I really, I, I always felt that the timing is not right. There's something really important happening during this three month period that I can't seem to schedule this without feeling like we're going to miss something or that I'm going to miss something. And I just never felt comfortable doing it. I also talk very candidly with board members about this, my board leadership, about, you know, can I take this time off? Here's what I've got going on. And they're going like, mm, can you think about next year? You know, so it wasn't like we weren't trying, but it was really hard to make it work. But boy, when we did it, and again, it was very thoughtful and deliberate, just like my transition was really thinking through and we kept it quiet we didn't tell everybody that this was happening but it, we put this in place a year and a half before i left mm. what is the cadence what does it look like in terms of search and finding a new right all that stuff the board chair the vice chair and i spent a lot of time thinking it through trying to look at all the contingencies risks etc but the board chair was like we will not say this to anybody that you're going to do this until we're ready to pull the trigger. And so we sat on it for a long time, which was very hard for me not to share that with the leadership team. I bet. Really wow. hard. Because I think they had a lot of questions about, yeah. so how long are you going to be here, David? Right. And I couldn't tell them. Yeah. And so you had very to come up with ways to not lie, but still be. I okay. would say things like, well, in five years, I won't be here. Right. To kind of give, and then five years, that's a long time. <laughs> 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 I thought you were thinking next year, and I'm right. like, maybe. <laughs> right, yeah, I said to be coy about it. I did. I had to be really coy, and it was yeah. very uncomfortable because these are people I trusted so deeply, yeah. and truthfully, I felt like. It affects them, yeah. And for their leadership, for their advice, for their contributions to the organization, knowing that this was on my mind and that I was planning on doing this could affect their own career trajectory their right. own advice to me about what things we take on and not take on. So I, I did feel like it was a hard, put them in a hard position, but I also, the board chair was adamant and clear with me that this was super important, that he had seen too many instances where once you make the announcement, the leader's no longer effective. There's lots of mishigash in the organization yeah. where people get all worked up about things and um, and so he just said, no, we're going to, it's going to be planned. We're going to tell the date and this is when it's going to happen. So it sounds like sound advice. And it, and it sounds like what you're describing now is maybe consulting other nonprofits about their boards or like what, it, what do you, what form do you think that's going to take? So I think there are three avenues. I haven't really, I'm, I made a commitment that I wouldn't spend my year thinking about this, okay. but as I'm getting closer now to 2024, it's starting to come a yeah. little bit more. So one could be consulting and helping nonprofits achieve their goals. Another one could be embedding in a nonprofit and mm. helping them take it. Like, you give me an assignment within a nonprofit. That actually feels really good to me. Rather than consulting, yeah. I'm not really helping to implement and do it. Mm -hmm. And I'm a doer. Yeah. I know how to do it. If you right. put me in and you say, and, and this is actually one thing I will say, because you asked me earlier about how do you manage in the time of crazy transition. The best thing that I, and it was my habit, was to look at the next board meeting. I thought board meetings, while a lot of work to prepare for them and everything, and I'd always put that as a milestone. What will we accomplish by the next board meeting? What things do I want to say we've accomplished? And then it makes a lot of the little things that crowd out the big things disappear. So answering emails. I was not the best at answering all the emails that came in. One of my board members looked over and saw the unread emails in my inbox. <laughs> That's a crime. <laughs> How dare you have so many unread? And I'm like, we get the things accomplished, the big things accomplished, because I'm not spending all day answering those emails. We're focused on the big picture, and we have to get these things done, then email. But too often, we get consumed by what's right in front of us, 
and the small little things that you do every day as tasks that you forget the big picture. So again, as somebody who's ambitious for the organization, I would set a flag. Here's where we're going to be in. Strategic planning was really good for this. We have a goal of increasing the size of this organization by 20% in the next year. Okay, that does not happen automatically. That takes deliberate planning and execution. And so I would always have benchmarks. By the next board meeting, we will be this far along toward that goal. Mm. And that really imposed a discipline of focusing on the big things and not the little things because the little things will kill you Yeah, crush you. And it yeah. crushes everybody, and especially in this world where communication is so it's instant. It's that ADD thing. It is. And I I have to turn off all the notifications because when the email comes in and it says it's from, yeah. oh, I want to read yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had to turn yeah. all those things off. Yeah. And I love this idea of you embedding in organizations. Are you mm. going to apply for Equal Justice Works Fellowship? Yeah, Bring exactly. Back full circle? Exactly. <laughs> um, I doubt I could win one of those. I never thought I could, ever. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I... I'm really th – I, I don't know whether that's my next uh, gig. Um, and then I've also thought about board service for different organizations. I got a lot right. of invitations to be on a board. That one, again, because it's so high level, I'm not sure it's the best place for me. Mm -hmm. um, I like actually getting in and doing things, Yeah, rolling up my sleeves and getting things done. And I absolutely love the relationships that I developed with people who supported Equal Justice Works. You know, a lot of people, a lot of executive directors hate the fundraising. Yeah. I love the fundraising. Yeah. I developed so many. It's one thing I feel really guilty about for the past year is that I have not been in touch with hundreds of people who matter so much to me. Yeah. I love them. And I've been silent because I've been yeah. focused on these adventures. I sent one email. Oh, excuse me. Mm. I sent one email in the summer where I um, wrote to all of the current and former board members and said, where in the world is David Stern? <laughs> and I said, I'm sorry that I haven't been in touch for the past nine months, but this is what I've been doing. And I gave a quick summary and five photos. Hmm. And that actually felt really good, but that is a tiny fraction of the number of people where I feel like I have that relationship. Mm. So it's, that's been the hardest thing for me is um, – saying goodbye. In fact, I wanted to come to this year's dinner, um, but the current CEO, Verna, and I agreed that as she's outlining her future, yeah. it's important not to have the shadow of the past. And you know it's distracting for the very reason you said. I go to that dinner. I'm running around the tables. Yeah, I'm saying star. hi to everybody. Yeah. It's distracting. And yeah. so she needs focus right now on what she, where she wants to take the organization and does not need the distraction of my attending. But I'm sad because I don't get to see a lot of people. And she knows this. We talked about it. Yeah. Sad that I won't be able to reconnect with a lot of people who are important in my life um, and yeah. who help the organization achieve its greatness. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting because, you know, you, you talked to at, at the beginning about, you know, having grown up with a certain level of wealth where it was like something you're trying to distance yourself from. You knew it affected how people interacted with you. And now it's interesting that you're kind of on the other side of the table where you know you have these this fundraising relationship with people where you know you're approaching them for resources and you i guess now have the context of being on both sides of it um not to say that people are approaching you in high school and college for money but it's that right. feeling yes and um, i'm just yeah really interested in in thinking about you know that little paradigm shift in you and and then yeah how do you maintain those relationships now that it's like you know, you're you're not the person that people are the face of who they're giving to, um, but you still want to be their friends or you still want to talk to them, but you're not going to ask them for a bunch of money. <laughs> right. Well, again, these are genuine relationships. Yeah. And I always felt like in a way the money might come in between it. But on mm -hmm. the other hand, and this is how I feel about fundraising, and I know it's a little crazy for people to hear this because people sometimes are so uncomfortable doing it. And I remember when we did that first dinner Ha, you know, chin cup in hand, going person by person, asking for funding. It was so hard. The kind of fundraising that I felt like I did, and again, it, I benefited from having been a philanthropist or participated in a family foundation. It should be fist pumping joy. When you give money away, you should be like, this is so awesome. I just gave money to enable something to happen that wouldn't happen without my support. Damn, that is 
I want to do that again. That's how people should feel about philanthropy. It should not be, oh, it's an obligation. I feel guilty. I have to do it. No, you really should find causes. If you're doing that, then you should really rethink your philanthropy. You should be finding things where you get pumped up and jazzed, and particularly about supporting the people in those organizations who are getting the work done. And that's why fellowships have been, to me, super easy to get excited about and to sell. And I'm using that, you know, to sell to people to want to sponsor because I think it does produce that kind of fist-pumping enthusiasm among, among supporters who say, God, this was so powerful. I loved it. And then, of course, they want to do it again. Yeah, that's a gift of giving. Um, well, I'd love to wrap up, but yeah. um, last question I have for you is just on the same uh, conversation about fundraising. Wh what advice do you have for people who are actively fundraising, who are starting a new nonprofits or starting to grow or pivoting their nonprofits? How do you approach fundraising? How do you think they should approach fundraising today? So this should be another episode um, yeah. because it's it's very involved. But I do think there are two things that I always think about, which is if you support the cause yourself, if you're that invested in it, it's contagious. It makes people feel and know that you're as committed as you're asking them to be. You're not asking them to do something you're not doing yourself. So I've always made personal contributions to Equal Justice Works and APIL. I feel very comfortable asking other people to do it because it's a cause that I've invested in. And I've invested in it in more than one way, not only financially, but also with my blood and sweat and tears, all <laughs> that. But I, I do think that that is a powerful thing for people to have when they're trying to enroll other people in it. I also think it's important to be able to boil it down. Everybody, lawyers in particular, we like to tell, we like to write a lot. We like to tell very complicated stories and the importance of simplifying it, getting it to its essence, an elevator speech is what we often call it. You know, the amount of time that you have between when they get in the elevator with somebody to when it hits the floor where they're going to exit, can you tell your story that quickly? So people need to fine-tune that elevator speech and fine-tune their mission and simplify it to its essence. And the person at Equal Justice Works, Sarah Lackritz, who really looked – we had pages and pages describing our work in detail, and then she works with somebody else and comes back and has a one-page brand page that is just, here's our mission, here's a vision. One sentence or two sentences each, tiny, was presented to the board while I was on sabbatical. A bunch of lawyers who edit everything that they see in fact, you, if you collect the board books afterwards, you'll see they edited the board books. <laughs> That's crazy. And they did not have anything to say about it. They were like, this is perfect. You have nailed it. And to have people who have been in you know, every branding decision around their firm or their company, and they're supporting this work, I mean, I could not have been more proud of Sarah and the team for producing that kind of synthesis. And any new person really needs to remember if you can really boil it down, we had little taglines in the beginning for the fellowship program, domestic peace corps for lawyers. Everybody could imagine what is that. I, I have in my mind's eye what that is. If mm -hmm. you start talking, yeah. lawyers developing ideas and they're gonna go and do this right. with a host organization in a city, what they come from, uh, it's too complicated. Yeah. And if you can dumb it down to something really simple that people can conceptualize, oh, yeah, I now know what you're talking about. You can fill in the details as they ask questions, but. Simple. Simple. Clear, clear branding. And, Ryder, going to the work that you have done with Equal Justice Works, and I really say this with such sincerity, storytelling, bringing it to life. The conceptual, this is a problem with the law generally. It's so remote and isolating to people. They don't understand how it affects people's lives. We'd always say to people, when, in, and this was absolutely the most important part of every application, was the personal statement, where you could talk about your credentials, you could talk about your history and all that stuff. When you talked about your motivation, what was in your blood that made you want to do this work, that is what's saying to people. Credentials be damned. It's when you saw people's drive and passion, that is what made people want to bet on it. And again, I feel like that was part of my winning formula too. They could see my passion in this work, and they'd be like, yeah, we want to support that. 
Through narrative and through storytelling. Absolutely. Narrative and storytelling is the most important part of it. And as you can tell from the time we spent together, I'm a big storyteller. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I have not yet figured out how to dumb it down <laughs> in a simple <laughs> thing. I, two long stories. No, but. this is wonderful. And thank you so much for um, coming and meeting me here and sitting down for this podcast. I really, really appreciate my it. My pleasure. David. My pleasure, Thank Brider. you so much. I've enjoyed it. Awesome. Awesome.